Ladies and gentlemen, your Excellency friends, welcome to Senate House, welcome to this event commemorating the 70th anniversary of the Institute of Commonwealth Studies, with particular emphasis on our work around human rights, with our first session focusing on South Africa, we move on to human rights more generally. Um, it's, uh, it's such a pleasure to be able to introduce this panel, which I will do very briefly because they genuinely don't need much introduction. And I will say a few words and then uh, open up to our, to our speakers. Um, Judge Albie Sachs has come over specially for this event all the way from Cape Town. Um, and it's, it's so wonderful to have him here. You all know who he is. He was on the Constitutional Court of South Africa from 1994 to 2009. As a, a lawyer in South Africa, he challenged apartheid. He was arrested, <coughs> imprisoned. His jail diaries became a major publishing phenomenon and were dramatized by the Royal Shakespeare Company. He survived assassination in Maputo in 1988 at which point he was invited over here to the Institute by Professor Schuller Marx and he established the South African Constitutional Center um, which he ran here for four years, I think it was four years before it moved to South Africa itself the University of the Western Cape in 1992 um, it's a huge privilege to, to have him here. Albi, thank you so much. Um, Shula as well. Shula's, I mean, Shula's time as director here in, as, in the 1980s, 1990s is still rightly remembered as the, as the glory days of the Institute, and I'll come back to that in a, in a minute. Uh, she came to the UK originally in, in, 19, in 1960 and was attached to SOAS, for much of that time, um, ending up as emeritus professor and honorary fellow there, and so as as we as we know is 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 encroaching gradually into into Senate House, and uh, so it's a, it's a perfect it's a perfect unity, um, and and you know third member of the panel, a really exciting. Younger scholar, Dr. Elizabeth Williams from Goldsmith, who's been working on the politics of race in South Africa and Britain. It's the title of her first book, um, Black British Solid Solidarity with the anti apartheid Struggle, yep. Um, published in 2015, and the paperback available now in the all, all good bookshops since 2017. Um, and her next book, uh, Black British Interdisciplinary Dis Perspectives on Nelson Mandela and His Legacy, is going to be launched in South Africa next year, this yes, year? Next year. Right. So this is a lovely way to start. It's a lovely way to start. The problem with <coughs> anniversaries, that I, I realise this as I get older, is that the older you get, the more anniversaries remind you of how old you are. Um, the last time we had a major anniversary here, I was just starting as director. It was the 60th anniversary and we, I was sort of preparing, preparing for that. And as, as a good historian who, who was just embarked on a very sharp learning curve, um, I did some historical research and I dug out lots of facts and interesting material about the origins of the of the Institute during the Second World War. And you know, on the good principle that you never let good material go to waste, it was sort of tempting to recycle it, recycle it here. I think no one will, no one will notice. Um, but, but actually, 10 years on, I have a very different perspective on the history of this place. And I, that's really what I, want to, what I want to talk about a little bit. For a start, you realise how quickly time goes. Seems not a very long time since I began here in 2009. 
And you realise that getting older is no accomplishment of itself. It's what you do with the time that matters. And if you look out there in the, in the broader Commonwealth community, there are many organisations of similar vintage to the Institute, some of which are still going strong, some of which aren't. And often one's struck by, you know, the same old faces, the same old arguments, the same old hopes and debates going on. So what really matters isn't the fact that the Institute is 70. It's good, people, we, many people, surely amongst them, fought very hard to keep this Institute going at times when it could very well not have kept going in the past. So reaching 70, okay, it's, it's, a, it's an achievement of sorts. But what I think matters, what I think really matters, is that every year, every year, the Institute renews itself. With new students, new visiting fellows from around the world. These are the lifeblood of the Institute. And every year, there is a fresh infusion. And that transforms what we are, transforms it all the time. We're old, but we're young. Just remember Charles Dickens' description of the, the ghost of Christmas past. Its hair was white as if with age, and yet the face had barely a wrinkle on it. I like to think of us in that way. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and our mission to generate knowledge and educate is key to that vitality, that ongoing vitality. But it also provides us with a guiding set of standards and a moral compass. The Institute is special because the Institute has always engaged passionately sometimes with the outside world. It's been a platform for key debates and having Albi here is a reminder that it's provided a haven for people at times doing transformative work that's made an impact on millions of lives. But what sustains and supports everything we do is our sense of identity as a community of scholars and the sense of professional standards that goes with that. And Shula provided a sense of that as director. During Schuller's time, yes, the Institute was known for its passionate political engagement with the events in Southern Africa. But that was underpinned by a really cutting edge intellectual engagement, which was unique and internationally renowned. And that search for academic quality has been our guiding star. It stopped us from engaging in gimmicks, in vanity projects, or being captured by any sorts of sectional interests. As a community of scholars within the Commonwealth community, our role is often misunderstood. Some expect us to give a kind of veneer of academic respectability to whatever form the Commonwealth Project happens to be taking at any given time. Rather like a bishop blessing a battleship. But what we do is quite different. We are scholars, we dispute, we disrupt, we question, we expose. <coughs> and more than ever, as our country is reduced to chaos by the purveyors of magical thinking, a lazy or mendacious rhetoric. I think this scholarly mission to expose error is a profoundly honourable and moral one. And it is again a source of renewal. We may be 70 years old, but what we're really thinking about is the future, the new projects. Corinne's wonderful new project on LGBT rights, which is just kicking off at the moment. Damien's new project on energy and human rights, and fracking and human rights. Sue's efforts to 
build on our wonderful work around Commonwealth Hall history and extend that to the diaspora communities, the Commonwealth diaspora communities in the UK itself. The fantastic work of our Refugee Law Initiative, both in terms of research and in terms of teaching. And that is simply part of an incredibly vibrant human rights project and series of projects based at, at, at the Institute, which has been building up since the 1990s. As I said, those of you with long memories will know it's sometimes been a struggle in the past to keep going. And the threats have come from a variety of different sources and ideological perspectives. But it profoundly matters that we survive and that we continue our work, and that we continue to be free to teach and research and dispute. Today we celebrate the deep and extensive roots that we've developed over 70 years. But what really matters, what really matters, is that each year we see the green shoots of renewal. It's like the trees in the Philip Larkin poem. Last year is dead, they seem to say. Begin afresh. Fresh, fresh. Thank you. I'll hand over to Al. Thank you very much. It's a very weird time to find myself back in London. An interception of something enormous and grand and something very specific, but it's really intense. And I'm overwhelmed by both of them. The enormous one is Brexit, and the small but meaningful one is the boycott. And Shula and I were asked not to attend, not to participate, because of the boycott of Senate House uh, that had been prompted by the outsourcing of workers and I can say straight off we're happy to be here now, we feel comfortable now, but comfortable on the basis that we wish to, and I've discussed this with, with uh, Shula, uh, express our general support for the workers and for insourcing. I might mention these were issues picked up by the students in South Africa in the roads must fall and the fees must fall issue. And there were various other issues. The first one on which the universities <coughs> gave in was in relation to insourcing. And it's not simply that outsourcing uh, results in weakening the power of the workers to have unions, to bargain for their conditions and so on. Uh, it destroys a very important element of the community. People have been working there for years, uh, often longer than the professors, longer than the students, very attached to the community and part of the community. And hopefully their children can now become not just cleaners and workers here, but also aspire to become professors here. And in any event, that theme was picked up very rapidly, but also in rather dramatic circumstances in South Africa, and we can only hope that uh, as speedy as possible a resolution can be found uh, in the case of uh, the Senate House uh, getting the workers back as quickly as possible. So that's not my presentation, that's my pre-presentation, <laughs> but that makes me free to give a presentation. Uh, so Shuna will go first, and we've agreed between us that she would prefer to give a shorter presentation and I would prefer to give a longer one. If I'm going on too much, just put up your hands. That says five minutes more. Should I just go ahead? Well, I'm so asked to talk about the Institute of Commonwealth Studies and the anti apartheid movement. And initially, I thought that would be a very easy thing to do. In fact, it's much more complicated. In 1982, at the suggestion of Professor Roland Oliver, who was my professor at the time uh, and was a doyen of African studies at SOAS, 
I was persuaded to apply for the position of the di of the dictator, revealing <laughs> <laughs> and the director of the Institute of Commonwealth Studies. I had a joint appointment at SOAS and the ICS. In fact, I had that joint appointment from the time that I joined um, the uh, uh, joint service. And somewhat apprehensively, I entered the interview room to find a formidable panel of academics waiting for me. They included the Chancellor um, of London University, Sir Randolph Burke, who quizzed me on linguistics, the Queen's representative of the Institute's governing body, and the Australian professor Geoffrey Belton, who opened the discussion. There were others, of course, too. Geoffrey Belton um, seemed intent on discovering whether I was a member of the Communist Party, <laughs> which was apparently the main concern of the Queen's representative, and he'd set himself up to, to take charge of that. It seemed to reassure him when I reported that my students called me a Schuler Marxist. So he asked, are you not a member of the Communist Party? And I was able to reassure him. And one member of the panel wrote subsequently to apologize, outraged that I should have been asked such a question. Interesting, uh, interesting to me when one thinks of who the person was. I was appointed director of the institute um, and took office early in October 1987. Now, what lay behind was that of my political affinities. In 1969, I chaired a meeting at the Institute to discuss the possibility of a seminar series at the ICS with a varied number of academics. It was a bit unnerving um, because the main speaker was late and I decided to go around the room asking those present to identify themselves and say what brought them to the meeting. Even more unnerving was the response of the formidable LSE anthropologist Professor Lucy Mayer, who responded to my question by asserting that she was not coming to any more of these. Fortunately, our speaker arrived shortly thereafter and the day was saved. Most of those present supported the idea of a seminar, which came to be called the Societies of Southern Africa in the 19th and 20th centuries. The seminar produced annual volumes from October 1969 to 1995, a couple of years after I'd left the ICS, in fact, and returned to SOAS. I'm delighted to say that one A. Sachs was a contributor to the ICS, the, the first of the ICS seminars. Um, the Society of Southern Africa in the 19th and 20th century um, was inaugurated there, and he gave a paper entitled Enter the British Legal Machine, Law and Administration at the at Law and Administration at the Cape, 1806 to 1910. This was the first, <coughs> but by no means the last, of his presentations at the seminar. And here he is again. Uh, it's great that you're able to be here today. Given the nature of the audience at the seminar, which included a number of South Africans being apartheid and the political environment in South Africa, the seminar often raised crucial issues in relation both to contemporary events in South and Southern Africa and to the long history of apartheid. It was open to difficult questions and there were on occasion fierce arguments. There was generally little bar on differences of opinion. It's probably true to say that the majority of the scholars and students who came to the seminar from the regular basis, many of them coming from universities in the rest of the UK, it was a time when we could afford to come by train to London once a week, <laughs> and beyond, tended to be on the left. A number were future lawyers and advocates from South Africa who came to study in the UK, usually at Oxford, and who soon found their way to seminars at the Institute. I was quite surprised recently to find out how many there were when I went back when I was in South Africa. During um, 
During the apartheid years, volumes of the societies of Southern Africa in the 19th and 20th century were also smuggled into, uh, into the country and read avidly and clandestinely by students and staff in English-speaking universities, both black and white. This said, the papers presented in <coughs> the seminar were not solely, de uh, not solely devoted to the issues of apartheid. Over the years, they ranged widely in theme and in terms of time and space. The span was huge, and few of the volumes are under 150 pages long. So, for that whole period, uh, they were in fact were um, at least 150 pages long, and um, quite often they reached past the 200 mark. The papers encompassed slavery, emancipation, questions of colored, colored identity in the 19th century of Cape, to ethnic nationalism, cultural imperialism, and the outlawing of television by the National Party in the 20th century. This uh, pro pro process continued over the years, and the um, uh, seminar only came to an end, really post post-apartheid, if we are post-apartheid, in uh, 2095, I think it was. While many, if not most of the contributors, may have motivated, um, have been motivated polit politically by the anti-apartheid movement, which is what I think I was supposed to be talking about, and they will have uh, encountered the AA um, in, at the Institute. The, in the collection, I think, in encompasses the huge range of ideas, which I would argue has much to tell us, even in this the 21st century. Okay. Yes. Well, I'm going to give a more flamboyant presentation. <laughs> and I'm going to start, now I'm going to start by dropping two names. Uh, the first is uh, Professor Dr. Schiller Marx, head of the Institute of Commonwealth Studies, and the second is Elizabeth, Queen of England. <laughs> and I met them both on the same occasion. <laughs> and I'm thinking back what makes a nice Republican guy like me end up in Buckingham Palace, <laughs> the Institute of Commonwealth Studies. And should I ask would I like to go? And I said yes. Well, what first of all made a guy like me end up in the Institute of Commonwealth Studies? Uh, it was a bomb in Maputo, put in my car by South African security agents that nearly killed me. Uh, I'm proof that they didn't succeed. Uh, I lost my arm, sight of one eye. I recovered ultimately in the London hospital. And I'm out of the hospital, I'm feeling joyous, they tried to kill me and I survived and as I got better my country would get better. And I felt fantastic, but I didn't know what I was going to do. And maybe I'd been out of hospital just a couple of days and Shula Marx and, and Mary Simons, who is often introduced as the daughter of Jack Simons, Jack <coughs> Simons was her father, come to see me, they want to see how I'm getting on. And I think Shula says, well, Albi, what are you planning to do now? I couldn't go back to Mozambique. Could have been another attempt on my life there. Uh, what should I do? So I said, Warwick University offered me a fellowship for three months and some, I think, New Zealand University for six months. What would you like to do? I said, Shula Mary, I would love to start working on a new constitution for South Africa. And they said, fine. So now I go around asking people, what would you like to do? I mm -hmm. asked my wife, Vanessa, what would you like to do? She said, architecture, I was amazed. Now she's an architect. Mm -hmm. So I throw that out to all of you. If you've ever had that opportunity to say to someone, what would you like to do? Sometimes, if there's some means of achieving it, in this case, it was achieved. Shona said, at the Institute of Commonwealth Studies, we've got a bathroom upstairs which we can convert into an office for you, and I'm sure we'll get money from Swedish International Development Agency and Ford Foundation. And the money came through, and I was able to do what I most wished and loved to do at that stage. Not to do research, 
not to write papers, not to go to seminars, but just to start thinking now. We've been fighting against the apartheid, against the land, to tear down, to tear down. We had the Freedom Charter setting out our values. But what kind of constitution are we going to have? And we already had five years of work in, in, in uh, Lusaka under the leadership of Oliver Tambo and Paolo Jordan, who were the real hero of our new constitution. And I asked the question in South Africa, if you did a paternity test on a constitution, mm -hmm. whose DNA would come up and very few people know? It's Oliver Tambor. And where did he get the basic idea from? It was from Paolo Jordan. Very African-based, African intellectually based whole project. It was against group rights. The regime then was saying we need power sharing between whites, Zulus, and the rest of the population. Three presidents. And then on Monday, the Clerk on Tuesday, with the Lazy on Wednesday, it would have been a total disaster. It would have given the whites a minority veto. And the Constitution would have been seen as the enemy of emancipation to retain white privilege against majority rule rather than the door opening to people's freedom. And we had worked out under the basic guidance of Oliver Tambor the basic project of majority rule, which was our equivalent of independence in South Africa. We didn't want a separate state. And to protect <coughs> basic rights, not through group rights, not through entrenching racial groups, but through individual rights for everybody, not because they're majority or minority or black or white, because they're human beings. We could only have a country if we start off everybody as a human being entitled to fundamental human rights. So that's the project that's in my head. But now I have to convert it into a series of documents. And we publish them in little, little formats with a nice ring binding, different colors for each one, and it would be on the future of the whites in South Africa. So it's not the native problem anymore, it's the white problem. Uh, the future of Roman Dutch law in South Africa, the legal system, the future of religion in South Africa, one I especially enjoyed, judges and gender, that whole theme. The only, uh, Catherine McKenna wrote to me afterwards, and she said, may I use your opening statement, the only truly non-racial institution in South Africa is patriarchy. And that was now in 1990. So these documents were coming out. It was just thinking. I was asked in an interview earlier, did you do library research? No, the research was our history, it was our experience. And moving the themes of the Freedom Charter, which were values, into ways of structuring government and protecting the rights of people. It was a marvellous period for me, and I have to say thank you, Shula, and thank you, ICS. And that's why I agreed to come here. I'm not sure if I'll come to your 80th birthday. Maybe I will. <laughs> Maybe I will. But um, it's not that I owe something. I love, I love the time I spent here. It was important for me, uh, and it fed into the transformation of South Africa in a very productive way. Thinking back, a couple of little specific experiences come to mind. The first was from here I was able to travel to Norway. I like Norway. A progressive social democratic country. It's free, it's open, but with strong social commitments, interesting culture. Maybe that can provide a good blueprint for our constitution and travel to Norway. And I discovered lo and behold, the constitution plays in no role in the society. Oh yes, we've got the 1830 constitution when we broke away from Denmark and the 1906 constitution when we broke away from Sweden or vice versa. It's a lovely document, but it's not important as an institutional enforcement basic, basic instrument. Uh, and it made me wonder, these are the countries that have a lot to offer us in South Africa now. Uh, many of us, have been, we've been socialists all our lives. I've lived through the Mozambican Revolution and I've been up with it and I've come down with it. We weren't able to sustain it. So pluralism I discovered in Mozambique. Might sound paradoxical, but through hard experience. And the need for law for the poor. We better off had connections, influence. It's actually the poor who needed rule of law in that situation more than others. So I'm armed with that mentally. And I'm thinking Norway will give us the blueprint. There's no blueprint there. So I'm thinking about it. There's a lot about the United Kingdom. Well, 
isn't the United Kingdom, the disunited kingdom, uh, the semi-united kingdom. Um, I hate saying Great Britain. Um, the UK. The UK is nice. Uh, that that I like. That's there's a sense of fairness and dignity and rights and things that you do and you don't do. And then the Netherlands has got an enormous amount to, to go for it. We had so many progressive people, so much support, and Denmark, uh, and countries like that. And what do they all have in common? Royalty. The monarchy. Now why is that relevant? Because the ruling classes the monarchical ruling classes did a deal with what we would call the bourgeoisie in the 19th century, late 18th century. They would remain as monarchs and the parliament would become the centre of political power. The parliament allied now to the new commercial classes, expansionist classes and so on. And you didn't need a constitution, you had a deal. It's only when you decapitate the monarchs <laughs> that the sovereign disappears and the issue of sovereignty arises not in terms of <coughs> colonial conquest or sovereignty over others but your internal sovereignty who rules it's not through the head of state being automatically according to the dynastic rules it's somehow parliament has got to elected bodies so you need a compact whether it's chucking out King George III in the United States or decapitating uh, Louis the 16th in France, you need a compact. And so that's why you have a constitution. Now it came to me like it was going to Norway and amusingly, I think amusingly, and I'm going to bring royalty into it again, when I got an honorary degree in this university some years back, I find myself sitting next to Princess Anne and I decide to uh, I think, is she the Chancellor or yeah. the Chancellor of this university? Uh, don't tell the boycotters, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and um, I give her my regicide theory of a Bill of Rights <laughs> and she ends up by saying, oh, but I do hope we don't have to use such drastic methods to get a Bill of Rights in the United <laughs> Kingdom. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was an important discovery for me, the difference between a constitutionalism and a constitution. And where this country is strong, and the social democratic countries in Northern Europe are strong, is in constitutionalism. It's a culture. It's a way of doing things. It's reinforced by strong civil society and strong conventions and practices. And that brought home to me, you need a written document in a country like ours, where we have no heads of government that will come in any automatic way but you also need constitutionalism and you need a constitution that's going to encourage constitutionalism rather than simply have a control over who's going to be in office and power in a certain way that was the Norway experience another experience the second one, the last one before I conclude is I'm sitting up in my office so knock on the door and a very, very British voice says, May I come in? And a man comes in with a very strong voice and he says, My name is, I forget what his name was then, I've just come from Long Cash in Belfast <coughs> and I had a conversation with the editorial board of the Sinn Féin publication inside Long Cash and they had just read your book the soft mentions of the freedom fighter and it provoked a very strong discussion in their ranks. Is it permissible for a freedom fighter to cry? <laughs> and this is beautiful for me, it's amazing, it's wonderful. And he tells me, and in the end they decided by a majority of three to two that it is possible <laughs> for a freedom fighter to cry. <laughs> It was a tiny little event, but in a sense it was symptomatic of reflection inside Sinn Féin about armed struggle to the bitter end or adopting other means, reflected in that way. I suspect it was some of the older Republicans who said you don't cry and the younger people, uh, you do cry and 
Uh, it was McCowan, in fact, was the editor at the time. Uh, he's turned out to be a poet, a writer, he's got a PhD, and he was very active in moving them forward. Uh, and at the time, I felt extremely awkward, very, very moved. But it wasn't for me, an ordinary member of the ANC, to be communicating with them at a time when British leaders were calling Mandela terrorists, or had been calling that. That's for top leadership to decide. So I didn't give him an answer. And I felt very bad about that. And about 10, 15 years later, I'm in Belfast at a meeting of ex-political prisoners. And I have two copies of something I'm going to show you afterwards, uh, which I want to give to them. I couldn't tell the difference between a Republican and um, uh, a loyalist. Tough working class Northern Ireland, they all look the same to me. In South Africa, you can look 90% of the time, just by looking at people, you know which side they're on in these struggles. In Northern Ireland, Protestant, Catholic, Republican, loyalists, I, I couldn't tell. In any event, I gave one to the organizer of the meeting, Avila, and I said, I don't know what to do with the other one. I can't cut it in half, and you'll see why. And Avila said, it's very clear what you must do. The man <coughs> whom you were afraid to send the message to is here in the room, that was Lawrence McCown. And we had a marvellous kind of a meeting there. And it all started in Institute of Commonwealth Studies, 28 uh, Russell Square. And we played quite a big role in South Africa in helping the process of decommissioning the armed struggle, the process of converting a relentless, historically deeply rooted struggle into a political struggle, taking a new kind of format. And I wouldn't say we got that as a result of ICS, but ICS at least provided the locality in which that happened. So what was the value for me? Uh, it was a space, a very safe and comfortable and agreeable space to think, to write, to get out ideas. And what it brought home to me was the importance of ideas. And I think that's something that unites us all on the panel. But they're not just any old ideas. It's ideas that connect up with people, with the problems of people that reach out, uh, meaningful ideas, and the more meaningful they are, the more they have to be interrogated. It doesn't let you off because they're meaningful. On the contrary, it heightens the need for intellectual discipline. And that was the wonderful thing of being associated here. Surely South Africa now is people with people in many sectors of our society who pass through those study groups, uh, who learnt how to think creatively, in a way that takes evidence seriously, in a way that enjoys dialogue and listens to other opinions, in a way that is principled, and at the same time in a way that was meaningful in terms of the subject matter. And it's something lasting, something uh, intangible, but uh, something that, that provides layers of intellectual seriousness and, and human heart in, engagement. And that's why I happen to be here today, and that's why I wish to just say thank you. I'm not a birthday lover, I don't celebrate my own birthday, <laughs> but I'm willing to say happy birthday, I see this. Thank, thank you. you very much. Wow, how on earth can one follow that? <laughs> that is such, so unfair. Um, <laughs> But uh, picking up on um, Judge Albie Sachs's comments, a safe space, interrogation of ideas. And I think I'd like to pick up on that because it wasn't only a safe space for those coming here and needing that space to work, but I would say that what we lack today and very much what I found when I came here as a young student uh, in the early 90s I can still remember sitting in the Southern African Studies series um, at the feet, if you like, of um, Chula at that point, and my eyes being widened and opened, being so exposed. When I remember the first time I came to London from the country, from Lincolnshire, um, two of the most impactful safe spaces for me was the ICS and was the Canon Collins Educational Trust under the directorship of Ethel de Kaiser. We don't speak her name enough, but 
if you like, these two very powerful women had quite an impact on me and my interests. And that's one of the things that causes me sorrow today in terms of young people, and that's what I'm going to go on to talk about and thinking about looking at projects forward. That's what they miss, not being able to have their eyes widened in such an extent to see their worlds as further than the postcodes um, where they live and not having a deep enough appreciation of all the other struggles that there are out there um, as well. The title of my paper is Premature Youth Mortality Then As Now Is a Human Rights Issue. And it was Nelson Mandela that said, there can be no keener revelation of a society's soul than the way in which it treats its children. During the 1970s and 80s, the disproportionate police targeting of black youth, and in some cases, the death in custody of young black urban kids was as shocking then as it is now. Then it was at the hands of the police, not that the police have totally cleaned up their act. As a matter of fact, black and minority ethnic people still die disproportionately as a result of the use of police force or restraint by them which continue to raise serious questions of institutional racism as a contributed factor uh, in, their deaths, in their deaths. But youth are now perishing at the hands of their own peers. A significant number of youth have, you see, internalised the devaluation of the lives of their peers with an added disregard for the other, fed by a deadly confluence of multifaceted factors. Partly, it can be argued that the rot was set decades ago, when the heavy-handedness of police, of urban policing methods, clearly crossed the line in many ways, and many would argue that that was a violation and a breach of their human rights. The 1980s from today, vantage point, seems almost an age of innocence, but don't be fooled. Speak to anyone that lived through that era, particularly to groups of black middle-aged men today who are middle-aged now but then were teenagers, on the London front line in places such as Railton Road in Brixton, Ladywell, Newcross, Sunderland Road, Lewisham, Peckham, <coughs> Stoke Newington and Hackney and many other London areas, they will give you vivid witness to the deaths in custody and to the constant assault against their young bodies from the police who were supposedly enforcing law and order under the Vagrancy Act of 1824, or keeping the peace with the menacing sounding Operation Swamp 81. In targeting the black communities, the work of the special patrol groups with its disproportionate arrests basically implemented the wholesale brutalization of a generation of black youths. Even their mothers weren't safe in their own homes. They became murder victims at the hands of the police. Do you remember the case of Dorothy Cherry Gross? Do you remember Cynthia Jarrett? And later, Joy Gardner and others? Examining the lists of names of deaths in custody at the hands of British police between 1978, of course the height of apartheid, to 1990, with over a third being blacks, makes sober reading, deaths in custody. Unforgettable was the largest march on the state to date at that time of the Black People's Day of Action from New Cross, Deptford, past Downing Street and Fleet Street, where many uh, projectile missiles were thrown and abuses shouted by the fourth estate, all the way to Hyde Park. 20,000 people in protest dramatically signalling their anger and disillusion at official <coughs> indifference at the fate of its youth. 13 dead, nothing said was the call. We demand justice. Blood are gonna run. Check the lyrics of Culture who wrote that. This symbolised an alienation of many from the British state. The later public acknowledgement of institutional racism was not news to black Britons living it daily, of course. So for the politically conscious black youth, activists, musicians, intellectuals, 
you can understand why so little distinction was made from their situation to the African youth fighting the South African police and the nationalist apparatus between the 70s and the 80s. And for this to really viscerally resonate with their own situation, particularly as the British PM continued to condemn Mandela and co more than she would perhaps both her and co. Even though for many, but not all, black activists, there was confusion and disappointment over the single focus of the British anti-apartheid movement, not willing to officially link the two essentially anti-racist struggles, that did not stop the action by myriads of black groups which campaigned to highlight Mandela and the African struggle. They utilised various genres to convey the message of solidarity and protest. Celebrated figures within black communities such as Robert Nesta Marley, who I know you all know, Steel Pulse, Tapazuki, Eddie Grant, Leslie Lyrics, Aswan, Bernie Sphere, Benjamin Zephaniah, Linton Quizzy Johnson, all informed their audiences through long established mediums of local community radio, the black press, dull poetry, reggae, calypso, and the like. Rather like the sharp, politically conscious musician and uh, artists and activists of today, grime artists like Stormzy, JME, known as JB Adinoga, Skepta, Julie Adinoga, Sister Audrey, Akala, whose phenomenal Sunday Times bestseller, Natives, Race and Class in the Ruins of Empire, rather like Rennie Edo's Lodges, Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race, they debunk the stereotype of unengaged, anti-intellectual black youth. So that was then. What about our contemporary challenges? Today, we are in a grip of a national crisis. I'm not referring to Brexit, though the site on Channel 4 last Thursday night of the female director of the CBI and the female deputy director of the TUC gloomily predicting a national crisis if the PM doesn't get her act together was, I'm sure, enough to frighten already panicky viewers saturated with Brexit coverage. Now, I'm referring to another national crisis as deadly as the opioid, opioid scourge across the USA, youth murders at the hands of peers, as well as against those unlucky passers-by or just unexplainable cruel murders using everyday ubiquitous yet deadly kitchen implements. Our society is angry, very angry, and our youth have, sections of our youth have, imbibed that anger. This isn't just an urban ghetto racialized phenomenon for as much as the lazy media and commentators would like us to believe. The spill across so-called county lines is proof of that, as are similar cases in other major towns and cities, in areas of traditionally low numbers of cosmopolitan communities, areas like Durham, Avon and Somerset, Devon and Cornwall, Cleveland, OK, West and South Yorkshire, Aldreds, Levy, Leafy Aldreds in the West Midlands, even where I grew up in Lincolnshire, Belfast. It is only very recently that Glasgow, once dubbed the most dangerous city or the murder capital of Europe, started to see its gang-related crime and drug figures fall. Nevertheless, the numbers of youth death in London are multiplying so rapidly, politicians took a step back from Brexit to disagree with the police and the Mayor of London over root causes, while community activists and affected parents, the media and various commentators all failed to agree over the causes and the remedy as new murders continue unabated. The multi-layered and complex root causes means that there are no quick easy fixes. Indeed, agreement over the solution seems as elusive as unity in the Conservative Party over Brexit. In one day, the former Home Secretary, now the PM, strangulated by her own party over the Brexit nightmare, 
and the police commissioner were busy contradicting each other over policing methods and government funding of their numbers on the street as ways to curb and reverse the appalling slide into uncontrollable lawlessness on London streets. I am not convinced personally if increased arrests, locking up people with longer, harsher sentences ever solve the root and branch causes and motivations for such crime, ask the Americans. Mm -hmm. As a young worker said in a recent BBC documentary, Stout, British Knife Crisis, harsher sentences, yes, tougher laws, prison disappears prison, but the social problems, poor communities and lack of investment remains the same. Glasgow is a case in point. It did not reduce its similar malaise that way. Instead, they invested in violence reduction <coughs> units which the British government has only recently committed to funding. Since that investment in Glasgow, there has been a near 50% falls in murders. One of the founders, who's a former policeman, shared his philosophy that hurt people hurt people. Get it? Mm. You have to give them opportunities to transform or they will transmit their anger and pain. The line between victim and perpetrator in some cases are blurred. We need to treat the traumas and the fears of these damaged individuals before they destroy the lives of others. There are so many opinions, touted solutions, and still silent perpetrators and enablers to unmask. Admittedly, there are the opportunistic <coughs> postcode youth criminals. But what about the big boys, the organized crime networks, whether homegrown or interlopers from other parts of Europe and further afield. The drug controlling gangs behind the petty, though deadly, urban gangs. What about the bored middle class high earners and largely silent county drug takers who provide the consumer market for the socially disengaged, alienated and excluded youth to be used as hapless mules across the county lines? Without a doubt, we're in a crisis of serious disproportional threat to sections of our youth. So, in continuing the tradition of exploring the good, the bad, <coughs> and the ugly realities of human societies, we must ask how the Institute of Commonwealth Studies can support researchers and encourage them to creatively examine and shed light on youth crime in the UK or comparatively to other Commonwealth countries. For example, South Africa, I believe, has a formidable youth crime statistics driven by legacy apartheid era ills as well as fresh social maladies which have arisen during the 25 year post democracy era. What can we learn from each other? What about other interrelated patterns of transnational and global human rights issues? Turning the focus on the family of nations that constitute the Commonwealth, alongside our research into the rich, interconnected, cultural, economic and educational networks, we must continue with urgency to examine and explore approaches to similar as well as distinct maladies influenced by inequality and social, economic and political drivers. For example, what comparisons and potential approaches of expertise can be shared while examining Jamaica and Trinidad's youth crime, which is as deadly as in Australia or Canada, where hate crime is as much a problem as we have tragically just recently witnessed in New Zealand as much as it is in the UK, or the high rates of cyberbullying amongst youth in Australia compared to rates in the UK or where domestic and general violence towards women in India is as troubling as it is in the UK, Australia and places and communities where our gaze often does not fall, like in Malta or Papua New Guinea or Pakistan. Or even examining disparities of wealth in places such as Singapore, South Africa and Canada. What can we learn from each other as we ask hard questions as researchers? The environment, especially water, predictions, health, inequalities of trade between the global north and south, which lots of times we don't talk about, the scourge, the re-emergent scourge of racism, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, homophobia, 
The list is endless. The continuing opportunities for skillful and meaningful research from diverse multidisciplinary specialists is rich. This calls for bravery and strong, independent-minded research, a characteristic that Professor Shula Marx and the scholarship emanating out of the Institute of Commonwealth Studies has never shied away from, asking uncomfortable questions, interrogating ideologies, and long-held shibboleths to create new ways of thinking through these complexities of our human life. I'll finish with Madiba. Our children are the rock on which our future will be built, our greatest asset as a nation. They will be the leaders of our country, the creators of our national wealth, those who care for and protect our people. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's great that this panel is sort of, we started with South Africa in the 1980s and 90s, but then moved into this kind of comparative discussion of race politics in, in, in Britain during the same period to the issue of, of youth crime. So Elizabeth is right, it's, it's striking that, you know, above the din of Brexit, that's one of the news stories that has actually been heard, the other news stories that's actually been heard recently. So it, it, this gives us a very kind of broad agenda for, for a discussion. Focusing on some of these issues, I'd be very interested to hear the, the thoughts of the audience, but also perhaps if um, at, at any stage, uh, I'll be sure would like to comment on what, what Elizabeth has said as well. So anyway, the floor is, the floor is open. So. Albie, did you, when, when Elizabeth was talking about youth crime, you were sort of nodding your, your head a little bit. Do you have any thoughts on, on what Elizabeth was saying? It's, it's a perverse thought. Uh, we used to say, we're struggling for future generations. And I believe in that. And suddenly, I don't believe that anymore. Mm -hmm. It's like postponing your own happiness, your own development, and you convert the future generations into almost a mythical category. And I think the biggest thing you can give to the youth is how you live your own lives. The biggest thing they can learn from you is from the experience of seeing you at work and how you make decisions and how you react. That means you've got to live for the time that you're in. And, and live it fully. And of course we have to be very concerned uh, about youth, but that's part of who we are now. Uh, my 12 year old son Oliver uh, asked me the other day, to actually give me the chance to mention, uh, the documents that this university uh, microfished when I came here from South Africa to exile uh, in, in 66, are now going to go to the museum and archive of the Constitution, we're building on Constitution Hill. And some young people were looking at the documents and I thought they'd be interested in how we cracked the notion of the kind of future Constitution we needed. They were much more interested in the trials that I was involved in as an advocate in Cape Town at the bar, defending Chris Hani's father under the racist laws. They couldn't believe it, uh, because it's another world that's as ancient as the French Revolution was to us you know, when, we, when we were young. And it suddenly makes me realize how much we have to give our, of our lives for people to interrogate, to look at, to hear from, to tell our stories. And I think that will animate the youth. Any event, the person questioning me on, on the radio, power radio, turned to one of the other panelists and said, I've got a 12 year old son or daughter who's born by museums. What are you going to do that will be interesting to my son? And when I came on next, I said, I've got a 12 year old son, Oliver. And he asked me the other day, Dad, what's the difference between communism and socialism? <laughs> and I started trying to explain it to him. 
and 1848 and the Communist Manifesto and World War I and the split in the social, and he was totally bored. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and, now, I think what you're saying is that uh, communists are hardcore socialists. And he kind of wrapped it up. And it's a marvelous thing <laughs> to hear from him. It wasn't quite that simple. Uh, but that, it's that kind of connection that I think is important. Uh, rather than to say we must do everything for the youth and look after them. Uh, our problems are very serious in South Africa. And we blame the whole structured systemic problems on, on apartheid. We have to. We inherited a deeply cleaved, uh, divided society, very unjust. But the problems have been, many of them, aggravated by our own mistakes. And what's fantastic about the present period is the rubbish is coming out. Uh, it, it's being exposed. It's, being, it's not being protected and, and, and denied. <coughs> and coupled with that, those institutions that we worked so hard to create under the Constitution are kicking in and working. The Constitutional Court the public protector, okay, the changing personnel, the function changes, uh, a free press, great investigative journalists, freedom of assembly, uh, a whole range of things like that. People speak their minds. And so the corrective to those problems will come not through denouncing the Constitution and saying it didn't give us everything, the Constitution can't build the houses, the homes, provide the medicines and so on. The Constitution can give you the matrix in which those things can be achieved by people. And just as we struggled, not one Mandela leading us to freedom, but people throughout the world, throughout South Africa, concerting the efforts towards a common goal, we're going to need that in South Africa today. Yes, there's a question. Yes, please. Um, hello, good afternoon. I have to ask you a question which will take you a bit out of South Africa, but I think it's very relevant, especially being in this setting and speaking of, on human rights. So the question is about Cameroon, which is located in West Africa. So Cameroon is one of these countries that was colonized by England and France and happens to be a member of the Commonwealth of Nations. Currently, especially since um, 2016, there has been a serious political crisis going on, which I would call a genocide, going by it by um, the definition of what a genocide is, people being killed at random because of their belief and because of the setting. Now, the situation is, where, what is the way forward if countries that are part of the Commonwealth Especially for researchers, what is the way forward for a researcher carrying out research on this country when, it, when it's part of the Commonwealth of Nations and it, nothing is being done or said and the country is being accepted into this fold of countries without much being said, the word isn't getting out that there is a genocide going on and people are being killed indiscriminately and because of because they were part of the English-speaking part of the country, which was an origin from the English colonial era, what could be done by researchers and what support could a researcher in this field get from the Institute of Commonwealth Studies to get the word out and sort of hopefully bring change like it was brought to South Africa? Okay, thank you very much. We'd like to... Now, would you take a few questions? Yes. Sorry. Okay, we'll take, okay, we'll take two or three, but, but I don't want to lose that one. Yes, um, I was just wondering, Albie, if you could maybe say a few words about what you think the state of constitutionalism is in South Africa today, because obviously there has been a lot of criticism of the Constitution, of the compromises that were made in 94, of the TRC. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just wanted to say that I found this fascinating, and particularly um, Elizabeth's thing, where it, you brought out so many things that are happening in the world right now, and there were there were moments where I wished you could have just backed up and repeated so I could because it was so it was so filled with things one after another, and then relating think, relating it to all the violence that's happening in the world here and through Brexit and in the United States with the with the with what's going on with I don't know, and you know. And so many, and, and what you've talked about with South Africa and and the people who are 
everywhere, it seems like the, everywhere there's struggle and there's, there's, there, there's um, discrimination and there's challenges. And it's like, and thinking back on things that seemed like they were going to be good in the future, somehow or another it looked like where, we, where have we gone? What, where are we going? And it's very frightening. Thank you very much. One, one more question to go back. Could I just pick up on what Albie said, because it struck a chord with a recent experience of mine, which is the difficulty of your 12-year-old son understanding the difference between socialism and communism in the Fort uh, The first time I went to Robben Island in 2004, as I was waiting on the ferry uh, at the terminal, there was the next door ferry, it was full of 13-year-old young mixed girls. And they were as bubbly and enthusiastic and noisy and irreverent as anywhere in the world. And it struck me that what they were going to see uh, on Robin Island was as, would be as remote to them as Julius Caesar crossing the Rubicon. And young people, in order to be, uh, relate to history and relate history to the present and their circumstances, need something that they can identify with. And I had the experience recently of taking a film I did about the people who were co-dependents with Nelson Mandela and their lawyers around South Africa and in America and in England. And I was astonished that when I showed it to young people, both university students, but also even 13-year-old school children, 200 school children from a black township in Ginsburg, or children at uh, the white school, now multiracial school in Gray College, where which used to be the heartland of Afrikaner nationalism, now a multiracial school. People, children, relate <coughs> instinctively and enthusiastically to inspiring stories about inspiring people. People who made sacrifices, committed, made commitment, uh, and had courage to change the world. And everywhere that, that, that I took that film and had those, showed those stories, young people, students, but also children, reacted incredibly positively by saying, well, if those people can change the world, what can I do to change the world? And there was an echo of this rather oddly, a lot of an odd echo of this I had on Saturday at the, uh, the People's March uh, in Parliament Square. And the last speech was Michael Heseltine, <laughs> not you would automatically think a hero of the same kind as Dennis Goldberg or Andrew Marvin But for the first time in, since David Cameron called the referendum over three years ago, I heard somebody articulate why the European Union project matters, why for 75 years we've had no war in Europe matters, why, what were the ideals that caused people to, what caused Winston Churchill to have the origin of, first of all, the United England and France, and then the United Europe. And the crowd responded to that in a way they didn't respond to other speeches, either on that occasion or that I've heard before. And so I guess the question is, is there not a role in inspiring children uh, about history in, as exactly as you say, making them learn from the, emulating the experience of people that they can see? And they can either be live people like you, Albie, or they can be people who tell their stories through films, through radio, through audio. Okay, thank you. There's, there's a lot to... A lot to think about there, and I'll give each member of the panel the chance to respond. I don't, I don't want to lose sight of that question on, on Cameroon. I mean, there may be people who know more or less about Cameroon, but, but let's just broaden it and say, of course, you know, the Commonwealth played a major role in campaigning against apartheid. The criticism is that it hasn't been so tough on human rights abuses elsewhere in, in the world in recent years. So would you like to start with that? I'd like to start with what I said to the Queen when I was with Schiller. And I think you're given 17 seconds or 21 seconds. And I'm in a line and I said, uh, I don't know if I said your majesty, I, that would take up two seconds. Uh, I said, our President Oliver Tambo has said, if South Africa gets democracy, we might wish to come back to the Commonwealth. <laughs> and so that brought in the, the Commonwealth dimension, and I don't know if she made a difference to our struggle. Uh, we always used to speak about terrains of struggle, and Buckingham Palace became a terrain of struggle. Um, in, in terms of the, the broad points that have been raised now, uh, I had a very, 
astonishing experience about 18 months ago at the Market Theatre in Johannesburg. We were discussing an anniversary of a modest conference on culture that was held in Amsterdam in, in the late 1980s. And I'm on the platform and there's a young black playwright and he said, what's this thing about tape that was so special? I almost collapsed. And I came up with the phrase, when the shackles fall, the pinpricks hurt. Not that they pinpricks, but you know, the system's gone and the little things, the covert racism, the assumption of superiority become intolerable. But I thought afterwards, you know what? It's fantastic that he can't even imagine apartheid. In that sense, we've cleansed our country of that huge system of white supremacy, racial domination. Now we can get to the covert, the systemic, but before it was so heavy, and the young people are growing up free of that, that, that enormous burden. <coughs> now I'm trying to find positives in everything, but that's a positive that, that, that convinces me. In terms of the inspirational, uh, I'm doing a lot of storytelling now. Uh, and I think what inspires them is not heroism, it's hope, uh, it's belief, it's idealism. And I think we have to do two things in South Africa at the same time. We've got to denounce corruption in a meaningful way. And young people are going to see that. It's not anything goes, because that is destroying idealism. When your top leaders, who were once heroic and, and beautiful people, are now grabbing money, telling lies, uh, deceiving and, and looting uh, state coffers and so on. You need that. But if that's all that's going on, it's just denunciation. And I think people are aching, as they are aching here of different ages, for something hopeful. And I find myself in a very unusual position for me. Uh, I'm a conservative, not conservative with capital C, but I'm hanging in there for certain old revolutionary values. Not the classical revolution, class struggle, means of production, stuff like that, but belief in the potential of humanity, belief in ordinary people making a difference, belief in you don't have to be clever and have PhDs and, uh, and wealthy and rich uh, to, make, to make a difference. Uh, a belief that we can overcome racial barriers, uh, gender barriers, class barriers, these kinds of beliefs. Uh, and what's given me enormous hope in South Africa is those values are the values that are coming forward. In a sense, we are contrarian. We were contrarian when we had peace, when nobody thought peace was possible. And now that we've got a certain president of the United States, we've got the case of Brexit here, we've got terrible nationalism in parts of Europe, we've got this ugly, horrible person in New Zealand thinking he's some kind of crazy hero. Uh, that South Africa with the old-fashioned rule of law, old-fashioned elections that are meaningful, old-fashioned freedom, old-fashioned freedom of speech, and old-fashioned belief in decency and dignity and honesty. Uh, becomes more and more important. And there are a lot of us there. And I'm finding there are a lot of us in America and a lot of us in the UK. Uh, so uh, that, that's all. I have nothing new to offer. Uh, I've had to expand my head. I've had to become much less rejectionist of traditional knowledge systems, what you used to call superstition. Uh, my understanding of science has had to be quite bent and adapted in all sorts of ways. Uh, there are lots of themes and areas where I've had to change and where my certainties of those days here have to give way. But there are certain core themes, certain core values. There are lots of really lovely, beautiful people around. And there are lots of people who are not lovely and beautiful in everything, but there are bits of love and beauty in them. Uh, and that march the other day, I think, was evidence of people who want to have a chance to express it. And if they find the political system as it exists is not giving them that full chance, then they go out into the streets and express it. They're not smashing windows, not burning things, not kicking other people in the pants, but just saying, this is what we want, this is what we believe in. So you can see a little bit of that thing, whatever it might be, of belief in hope, things eternal in me, and I'm discovering in a lot of the old sports in South Africa. I saw Wally Sorotti the other day beaming. He'd been walking around for years with a long face and he's beaming. There's a certain sense of joy that we are reasserting something in South Africa. It's not a foregone conclusion that it will survive, 
but it, it's a very positive kind of a thing. What was revolutionary then is old-fashioned now, and we are clinging to those different things. Sure, do you want to come? South Africa is actually reintroducing God on all levels. All, they, God, South Africa is reintroducing God, various faiths and truths and all that is getting very big in South Africa, and that I think is the source of a great deal of the healing that's going on there. The churches are very powerful now. And the whole of South Africa. Thanks. I'm going to leave with that as a non-believer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all my heart. And, and perhaps, perhaps we can all just turn to God just a little bit more. Go back, as you said, we're now getting to that age where we realise the truths that we've had in our childhood, and which the children today are not getting. They're not getting it in schools. Then none of the teachers are Christians anymore. We all grew up learning the Lord's Prayer at assembly when we were little. They don't even know what it is. Okay, Elizabeth. Well, as a Christian, I think you're pretty brave to say that <laughs> in a place like this. But, um, yeah, love goes a long way. Um, I pick up on what Alby says. Lots of beautiful people out there. And, I, you know, obviously I too would champion that and say lots of beautiful people who don't look like you. You know, um, I'm right there. So I've got a 14-month-old and I really feel the weight of thinking, oh, you're a historian, don't shout at the TV. I'm very, very aware that he looks very closely at everything I do and say. He looks at my facial features. And of course, you know, when they're brand new, you don't want them to take forward your biases, uh, unconscious or conscious. And I think it is actually quite a weight that we carry. How do we influence those uh, that are among us? Um, and I, I would, again, you know, go back to that thing of, I usually say to my, to my godchildren in my life, ask your parents about their stories. Because we often think that inspirational people are people like Albie Sachs, <laughs> Shula Marx, Nelson Mandela, we can't, Oliver Tambo. You know, we can't touch those people. But actually... They were fathers, weren't they? They were mothers. They were aunties, they were uncles. And we have inspirational people here. It took me nearly 40 to realise how inspirational my mother and my father were, leaving their country at 17, 18, coming to England and all the things that they went through. You know, you've got to grow with that. And lots of times we don't speak to our children. I remember reading Eva, um, Eva Hoffman Stettel, where she goes back to Poland and she goes to this Stettel trying to find herself because her parents try to, understandably so, protect her from that. And I think sometimes we have to speak to our children and expose them and let them realise, you know, the struggle so that we are arming them with the tools to be able to see beyond all of these maladies that, that we have in the world and understand very um, sort of keenly that actually there's nothing new under the sun, you know? It's nothing new under the sun. So I think we really have to talk to our young people and tell them our stories, encourage them, take them, as you say, to different places, expose them to different peoples, um, and hopefully they can pick that up through osmosis. Uh, I, we're getting close to coffee, but a, 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 another former director <laughs> of the Institute of Common Studies caught my eye, and the gentleman sitting next to him as well. So, if we could, two final questions, but if we can keep quite brief. It, it, it's, it's more a response to the question about Cameroon, yeah, which please. I think is yeah. quite important. Good. Yeah, yeah. Because you were wanting yeah. that to be yeah. tackled. Uh, until until the fall of the Berlin Wall and then the liberation of well, the, the unbanning of the ANC and the, the prospect of uh, early election victory for the ANC after 1990. Until that period, the Commonwealth did not have, uh, it, it didn't emphasize uh, values like its commitment to democracy, free press, and human rights that much. But when that period, in that period, particularly influenced by the events in South Africa, and by the presence of Mandela at the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting, for example, uh, as the Commonwealth began to uh, commit itself more firmly to democratic values, 
freedom of the press, etc., and, and to human rights, the respect and defense of human rights. And it did so under a particularly uh, uh, constructive and imaginative Secretary General, Chiban Yaoku, from Niger who was from Nigeria, which at the time was actually had been tossed out of the Commonwealth for violating these principles. Now, as that, as that point suggests, the Commonwealth then began to put pressure on governments, Commonwealth member governments, which behaved in violation of these commitments. And they created something called the Commonwealth Ministerial Action Group, CMAG, which is a collection of ministers from a few countries in the Commonwealth. And if they found a, a, a government, this has happened in Pakistan, this happened to Zimbabwe, uh, was in violation of these principles, it would go to that country. Uh, country. And as one member of CMAG told me once, we said some very unpleasant things with them. And they said some very unpleasant things back to us. And then they claimed they didn't care what we did or what we thought. But then when they got thrown out of the Commonwealth or were threatened with it, they got very nervous because they didn't like to be seen to be you know, treated as uh, uh, in violation of these commitments. So the Commonwealth has this process, this, this, this structure to deal with cases, for example, perhaps like Cameroon. But the Commonwealth's commitment to these principles and, to, and, and its use of CMAG has, has sort of risen and fallen, waxed and waned over time. Before 1990, there was not so much of this. Thereafter, there was uh, an era uh, where it was particularly constructive. And then uh, there was a very bad period. Uh, when Mr. Sharma became Secretary General, uh, when uh, the grotesquely abusive regime in Sri Lanka was not only tolerated but endorsed with the Commonwealth as a government meeting. And that was an extremely grim period. And scholars at this institute, uh, as they did during the apartheid era, they raised hell in their, with their research and their publications about the injustices that were going on there. It didn't make any difference to Mr. Sharma, but uh, uh, since he ceased to be Secretary General of the Commonwealth, he's bounced back a bit. So, it, uh, you know, CMAG and the commitment to these principles now is, you know, is, is less, uh, is not dismissed in the way it was in that era. So, um, you know, the, the, the Commonwealth is a human institution with, with uh, pluses and minuses, and, and, wax, and these things wax and wane, but that's the general picture when it comes to cases like, perhaps, like Cameron's. Yeah. I, I mean, I'd I just say, um, I, I remember sort of spending some time at the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in Perth in 2011, handing out a subversive little pamphlet on this very issue by one James Maynard. Uh, so, yeah, we, we, we sort of tried to do our best. Final questions. Yes, thank you very much. I'll try and be extremely brief. Um, John Battersby, one of my hats is as the Chairman of Trustees of the Karen Collins Educational and Legal Assistance Trust, so it's a great honour both to hear these fascinating um, presentations, but also to be in the presence of Shula Marks, who was one of our trustees, and to hear about Ethel de Kaiser, who I met in, my last, uh, in her last year, I should say. Um, so what's filling my head at the moment is this theme of exclusion. Everything that has been discussed today um, and so brilliantly presented, is actually about exclusion. In South Africa, the majority was excluded. Was excluded. So the only way we could deal with that was a complete and total institutional um, democratic transformation, revolution, negotiated revolution, whatever you want to call it. In Britain, of course, it's, it's more complicated because black people are excluded within a so-called democratic constitution. So, I would be interested to know, as a researcher and um, as academics, what can be done. I've noticed, I lived here 20, 25 years ago, and I came back uh, 12, 13 years ago, and I noticed huge changes, um, but not in institutional ways so much, as, my God, now in advertising, this looks like a much more inclusive society. When I go to the theatre now, even, uh, you go to very few theatres, there isn't at least one or two um, uh, black actors, uh, so you see that kind of change, um, and I guess the Met Police have been forced into certain changes, but now the symptoms, um, which is this extraordinary proliferation of knife crime, and I was absolutely intrigued by your presentation, 
Um, what, is, what is to be done about la, un, the underlying causes? Because putting people through the criminal justice system and in prison is not going to help it at all. Um, so I guess the, those are the issues that, uh, that, you know, and the exclusion applies just as much to the exclusion of Cameroon. And I mean, I think the significance of the Commonwealth Forum is that the Commonwealth is an inclusive organization. Some people like to dismiss it as a quaint, funny old colonial hankering after empire, but in fact, it's an incredibly important um, collection of, 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 of countries, and it's all about inclusion. And if we look at the world today, all the things that have been mentioned, America, Trump's America, it's all about the exclusion mm. of people. I mean, I come from South Africa, and people try and convince me, no, no, you must vote for Brexit because then South Africa is going to have better trade deal. Give me a bloody break. <laughs> I've spent my whole life, you know, fighting for inclusion. And you've got this ridiculous bloody thing called Brexit, which is going to exclude yeah. people. You know, please don't ask yeah. me to try and be objective yeah. when it comes to Brexit. I'll let, I'll let Elizabeth take this, this one up. But I, I want to just, and you can see I've got a vested interest here. A piece of academic research that would address this at a place of multi disciplinary institution like the Institute of Common Studies, what might it look like? Oh, thanks. One thing I wanted to say about inclusion, and I don't know if you're aware that there's a real um, groundswell and shift at the moment of um, all students, not just black, but white students who rather like their peers in South Africa are not so much saying roads must fall, but that we must decolonize the curriculum. And I think that it's very, very interesting because a lot of the institutions now, the universities, um, are beginning to listen to this. Um, reports that are coming out, um, a, a very celebrated one by Nicola Rollick, for instance, looking at uh, black professors within the system and calling for uh, the inclusion, because we have enough, perhaps you don't see us, but we are there, um, of why it is that we're not being included in the structures, looking at things like attainment and mental health, etc., which I think also ties so that space must be made. The students, the consumers are now noticing why is my professor only white? We need to have a diverse, and our student body is diverse. We are recruiting from the Middle East, you know, Southeast, and all these places, um, and they want to see representatives of. Um, as well. Um, but also in terms of asking, well, what are the solutions for this knife crime? Well, I guess one of the ways um, that the Scots have been able to start turning things around is to see it in this multidisciplinary way, to say this isn't just about crime, this is about mental health, this is a national crisis that we must attack from as many different places as possible. So for me, what that would look like would be um, pulling people from these different areas of social justice, the NHS, because I think they declared it a national emergency, a healthy emergency, um, but pulling different specialists together and putting them in this room and getting them to thrash out um, solutions together because it's not one size fits all, is it? Thank Can you. I just make one quick comment? I think that language is very important, and I think many, many of us forget it. And one of the things that, a pet peeve of mine, is people who refer to the United States as America. You know, the, America is much bigger than the United States, and, and should, we should not allow the United States to own America. I'm gonna, we, we're going to move to, to coffee now. Before we, before we thank our speakers, I'd like to thank one other person who's hovering around. That's Sue, my colleague Dr. Sue Onslow, who has organised uh, this day and has been thinking about it and shaping it for a very long, long time. And so thank you so much, Sue. For that. <laughs> We also, let's see what this poster was. <laughs> okay, it doesn't say boycott Senate House. Okay, yeah, thank <laughs> you. So what, tell us what's this. That's the South African Bill of Rights right. that we were dreaming of, sitting here in a converted bathroom 
a magazine of Central <laughs> South Africa with a dignified, decent Bill of Rights. <laughs> it's got gender rights, it's got sexual orientation rights, it's got rights to redistribute land, it's got workers' rights, it's got children's rights, very strong children's rights in it. Uh, and this was adopted by an overwhelmingly black parliament, mm -hmm. constitutional assembly, 1994, people who've been in jail, who've been in the underground, who've been on Robben Island, uh, they adopted these rights, fundamental rights, and I'm giving one now to the Institute of Commonwealth Studies oh, and one so to Shula Marx. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Senior Lecturer in Human Rights at the Institute of Commonwealth Studies, and also as co-director of the Human Rights Consortium, which supports work across the School of Advanced Study on human rights research and education. And I'm very pleased to be panel, uh, chairing this panel on the Institute of Commonwealth Studies and Human Rights since the 1990s. And before I introduce our guest uh, speakers today, I'd like to just um, begin with a short preface to contextualize the work of our panelists uh, to follow. Um, perhaps I'll just briefly introduce them. We have on my far uh, left uh, David White, who's director of the London Office of the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative. Next to him is Dr. Lars, Lars Waldorf, who's reader-in-law at Dundee Law School. And next to me is Karen Hines, who's a PhD student here at the Institute of Commonwealth Studies. And I'll say more about that in a moment. Um, but first, let me just uh, start by outlining a little bit of the work of human rights since the 1990s at the Institute, which has been shaped largely by its teaching programs, both masters and PhD. I'm pleased that some of our MA students are here today. Uh, our work with human rights organizations, including the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative, and our support to promotion and dissemination of research on human rights. So in the area of teaching, the Institute of Commonwealth Studies has uh, for, for many years had a strong concentra concentration of faculty with a research program on human rights, which has attracted many students to come and do PhD programs uh, on human rights with us. We also established in 2012 the Louise Arbor PhD Studentship for Human Rights uh, Research to further support the best of new research in human rights. So we have a really exciting cohort of PhD students using human rights uh, frameworks to investigate contemporary problems such as minority and indigenous people's rights, uh, genocide, uh, refugee protection, to name just a few. And we'll have a chance to hear later from uh, Karen Hunt and her important work on political inclusion. We also launched the MA in Understanding and Securing Human Rights in 1995 under the director, Professor James Maynard, who's joining us today as well. The aim in developing that program was to offer an interdisciplinary degree in human rights that was also practice-based. And to that end, the curriculum was developed with and partly delivered by staff from Amnesty International. And students had the chance to learn skills used in human rights organizations, like campaigning, and also to hear directly from practitioners about the daily challenges of their work. And now, some 25 years uh, later, nearly, we have uh, about 800 graduates of that master's program, uh, which these are alumni working in human rights NGOs, uh, in government, international organizations at the UN, and increasingly in the area of business. And last year, we launched the Distance Learning MA in Human Rights that mirrors that campus program with the University of London worldwide. So it's really enhancing our ability to increase access to human rights education globally. And we will hear today also from uh, Lars Waldo, who taught the MA stream on our master's program, the, the law stream on our MA program for several years. And he also helped to develop the Human Rights Consortium, which has consolidated our research and teaching work in human rights. The Human Rights Consortium leads uh, on our work with human rights organizations, especially through the platform of the Human Rights Researchers Network, which was established a few years ago to bring together researchers in the academy and NGOs or other institutions to discuss common challenges. And one of the NGOs that we have worked with many times over the years is the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative, which I understand was founded in the Institute's walls, as it were, before moving its headquarters to New Delhi. And David will be sharing more information uh, with us on past collaboration. 
And certainly our students have benefited gratefully from uh, internship op opportunities generally, generously offered by the, uh, the CHRI. And to conclude, to conclude, I'd like to just highlight one example of cooperation with the CHRI on our work uh, in the protection of LGBTI human rights. With them, we jointly organized a conference on decriminalization of same-sex sexual relations in the Commonwealth States in 2010. That conference aimed to bring together researchers and NGOs working on this topic in the UK and then it, it blossomed into an edited book with contributions from activists and scholars across the Commonwealth. This is the book that we produced. That has been downloaded more than 45,000 times since it was published in 2013, thanks to the school's open access publications program. And we also published a sister companion to that book called Envisioning Global LGBT Human Rights just last year also as open access. And this is one example of how research can contribute helpfully to social change. And I'm happy to announce publicly for the first time here today that the Institute of Commonwealth Studies is also one of nine consortium partners in a new program funded by the UK Department for International Development called Strong in Diversity, Bold on Inclusion which will focus on supporting LGBT inclusion in uh, several African cities over the next four years. That program will work with societal leaders, uh, like religious leaders, the media, and business to promote economic and social rights and well-being. And we're very honored to be leading an international research team that will be supporting civil society activism on these issues at the local level. Uh, so with that, I'd like to invite our speakers to share with us their own reflections on their core research <coughs> within Commonwealth Studies uh, and related to the Institute of Commonwealth Studies. I'd like to begin by inviting Karen Hunt to speak with us. She has achieved her Bachelor of Science, Political Science and her MA in International Conflict Analysis and is currently completing her PhD here on the topic of the electoral socialization of Caribbean Britain. Since 2013, she has organized a series of conferences and events at the University of London and the British Library, uh, including uh, the U.S. in the Caribbean, 30 Years After American Fury, Forward Ever, The Killing of a Revolution, um, and uh, let's see, In Prison for 26 Years in Conversation with Selwyn Strachan about Caribbean Britain, uh, and, and several others. So we're very pleased that she has been actively involved in trying to expand the research program of the Institute, as well as juggling her own research in a busy day <laughs> job. So thank you, Karen, for doing it. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Um, like Corinne said, I, I'm a PhD student here, and I'm studying the electoral socialization of Caribbean Britain, which basically um, explores why Caribbean Britain behaves the way it does electorally and politically. I'll explain a bit about, about, about my motivation for doing the research, the investigation, what the sort of, crump, the sort of misunderstanding within, within the investigation is, also how it relates to human rights, and also how it changed my methodology, um, having looked at why um, Caribbean Britain behaved the way it was, it's kind of like a suspicion of academia, well it's, I'll explain, um, but how it changed, influenced my methodology and how I had to engage uh, with the Caribbean population. So, um, my motivation was, I've been involved in politics, I've also got a political family who are from Grenada. Um, they haven't been elected, but it's a political culture. Um, they know political pol you know, politicians and so forth, and people that are active in politics. <coughs> I myself was a candidate to the Greater London Assembly, um, I was an elected councillor, and I engaged with Caribbean people, you know, locally, this was in Ealing, in London. Um, but when I looked at the research, having done politics at undergraduate and graduate level, um, there was this argument that the, the Caribbean population were disengaged politically, um, they didn't vote, which is true, they have the lowest turnout um, in this country, and consistently so, regardless of other ethnic minorities or populations coming through, they've consistently had the lowest turnout electorally, um, obviously in elections. But I wanted to investigate this. I didn't. I couldn't align the story that we were not political people, Caribbean population weren't political people in Britain, but they were, they seemed political, you know, when I engaged with the Caribbean population. So I, I investigated this, and that's what basically the electoral socialization of Caribbean 
Britain, looks at why they behave in the way they do. Um, in research, the arguments were that they were politically illiterate because they voted Labour predominantly, but they were socially conservative, and that was the sort of reasoning given behind it. There was also uh, literature that said they were mysterious, it's a big mystery that they don't know how to vote, um, and a voting, un what, what was the word? A, a, not according to their expected behaviour. Um, and also, uh, there's a, in electoral studies, political studies generally in this country, there tends to be a dominance of African-American history, African-American civil rights, and also Africa. Africa as in the country, not the continent. There's this sort of, there's this sort of black umbrella that goes over all politics, as if there's no sort of political socialization that takes place. It don't come from different roots. So to me, that wasn't helpful. It was too simple, and it wasn't, it, to me, it didn't seem true. Because like I said, the Caribbean population seemed very political. They've got emancipation, history of emancipation, uh, a lot of the music, calypso, reggae, tends to be very political, um, had a history of political activism in this country, regards to equality and race relations. So it didn't seem true to me. So I looked at the political history. That's because that's what other populations do. That's what the British population does generally. They go back and back. Why, why do we behave the way that we do? But they seem to be expecting the Caribbean population, who have a different political route, to behave in the same way that everybody else does. Um, so this is where the, the human rights stem, the human rights issue comes in. Because if you look at the Caribbean population or any post-enslavement population. They don't have a history of voting for that long. Um, also, they had an issue with they were dehumanised. So you were excluded from politics, you were excluded from voting, because part of your political and electoral socialisation was being dehumanised, was being excluded, was being enslaved. So, and you weren't human. So if you, you, you had to be human to be politically um, effective, to be politically included. So if you weren't part of that political socialisation, you can't expect a population to behave the way those people who were included, um, you can't expect them to behave the same. So that's, that's I investigated um, that, that aspect of political heritage, basically. So I made a contrast between the political heritage of what I call the Anglo-Atlantic and the Afro-Atlantic, looking at people that have been dehumanised politically. Um, so there are different, there are different political landscapes. So that's kind of the ex explanation. You can't expect people to behave differently. Um, similarly, if they have a different political uh, history, and also I critique that there's an umbrella, like I said, that there's because you have a particular colour skin that you must behave identically, whether it's black or white, predominantly because I'm looking at the Afro population, black population, that if you've had a different route here, you're not going to behave similarly. So the African population tend to be very conservative. They've got majority of the MPs now in Parliament, given that the Caribbean population arrived first. So there's a different population, they've got a different political behaviour and political success, I would argue, as well. So you can't expect people to think the same way, and that that's, comes from social eugenics, I've argued as well, um, that you expect people to behave the same way if they've got the same skin colour. Um, so uh, that's what I've sort of I've critiqued. And my response has been that, well, they've been politically silenced. Although they have carrying population in this country, always have, um, they agree that political protest, an illegal political protest, is legitimate more than any other community in this country. That uh, that also is aligned to their political heritage. That because they've got an adversarial adversarial relationship with institutions, political institutions, that they would actually think that some illegal protest would be le legitimate. And if you look at various uh, political heroes, whether it's Mandela or um, Malcolm X or Caribbean people, um, certainly in Grenada as well, you'll see that some of those political heroes are, um, are, are, have been imprisoned or had some sort of contact with criminal justice um, on the other side of the law. So that's basically my research, but I'm, I said I would talk about methodology because although politics, although there's been exclusion, exclusion from politics and electoral socialisation. There has also been the people that implemented that or were uh, 
I suppose, accommodating that were also researchers and academic researchers. It was in their interest to uh, promote the, these, these areas, these kinds of thinking, not, not, uh, not entirely, but they did contrib contribute to that. Um, so when I did start researching, I really had to make the efforts to engage with the population, um, the Caribbean population. And hence, I had a series of events here. But the argument has always been that the Caribbean population is hard to reach. That's not actually the case. I believe that, and my experience has been that they're very wary and wary and aware and suspicious of researchers because of the history of research um, against, I suppose, dehumanised populations. So, in turn, in in order to try and be more inclusive, to have their voice as centre of my research, I had to be very engaged and have loads of events and also have more peer knowledge. I also put myself at the centre of the research as well. Because I'll give you one example. I had a, a start, I had arranged an event here and I got whiff that the Caribbean population would come in to you know, storm it. Um, you know, that, that, and I got emails that, you know, History should be by the victor, no, not by the victors, but by the victims, and a lot of political stuff. They obviously didn't realise who was doing this event. And when I took them to dinner, I said, so why were you going to sort of ruin my event? And I said, oh, well, we didn't realise, we didn't realise, I'm very apologetic and stuff. But that gives an, an example of how they thought that academia or research, any kind of research about the Caribbean population, um, was, they had, they had to attack it, it was really bad. That changed, and um, I think that overcoming that mistrust and that abrasiveness, they engaged more with the events that I had. They were all sold out eventually, and that's the British Library, all of the British Library sold out within 24 hours. That was an event on Grenada. Um, another event here, Sonny Ramfield, that, that was completely full. All of the events that I've done sold out. And that wouldn't have been the case if I hadn't really engaged with the community and tried to convince them that actually we're not here to research you, we're here to listen to you, have your voice. Because their voice had been silenced politically and maybe in, in terms of research as well. So I think I might be close to my time. Um, but that's, I mean, I'll obviously I open to questions, but that's what my research is was about um, and I think oh and my last sentence is that hidden histories and communities that had research previously work against them I think that can be overcome and turned around if you engage correctly and ethically with um, various those communities so uh, you know there's no need to attack um, the research you can actually engage thank you Thank you, Karen. I think that was a fantastic example of how we can use critical theory to really challenge conventional thinking in, in the academy. Uh, also with your important critical research that maybe we can talk about a bit mm -hmm. more in the, in the discussion. Next, I'd like to invite David White to say a few words. He's director of the London office of the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative and acts as liaison officer with the Commonwealth Secretariat and other London-based multilateral organizations. Uh, he leads on advocacy with the Commonwealth and on CHRI work in the Western Hemisphere. He has a master's degree in diplomacy and international relations and is the author of a recent flagship report of CHR on human trafficking, modern slavery, and child exploitation in the Commonwealth. David, please. Thank you very much. Um, I've been asked to speak about uh, the impact of the Institute of Commonwealth Studies work on human rights and its relationship uh, with CHRI, the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative. Um, I think my contention would be quite strongly that um, its work and its impact has been variable but strong and given the current climate within London and within the Commonwealth uh, there is an opportunity to perhaps do even more and have more impact and I'm going to make three sort of scene setting points and then talk about the relationship with CHRI and the Institute um, give another example that perhaps provides a, a better roadmap um, for real impact going forwards and then just make a couple of general points in conclusion. Um, I think my first point to set the scene is that the official Commonwealth is never going to be the public champion of human rights that presumably everybody in the room would want. Um, it is the source of enormous amounts of frustration um, with almost everybody I speak to, but it remains true. Um, you know, there have been some very good examples of heads of government acting independently and in concert normally when they're separated from officials. 
um, the expulsion of Nigeria in 1995 is a good one. Um, lots of examples of good offices being used to affect secretaries general visiting um, imprisoned opposition leaders, um, you know, parliaments with hostages in Fiji, and a lot, a lot more things at a lower level. But really, if you look at the, the big ticket issues, the Commonwealth is generally found short. Um, it's interesting we've been talking about uh, South Africa and apartheid earlier. Um, we have to remember that the, the Commonwealth was done a big favour in 1961 when South Africa didn't apply to rejoin. And it gave, they probably wouldn't have come in anyway, which is why they, they didn't, but being outside gave the Commonwealth an opportunity to form a, a common, almost common position and advocate against it. If we look at other um, egregious breaches, such as Kashmir, the fact that you have India and Pakistan in the Commonwealth negates any discussion and any action, really. Um, and Cameroon was mentioned earlier. Uh, so Cameroon was mentioned and discussed at the last two uh, Commonwealth Ministerial Action Group meetings. CHRI uh, did advocacy before the last three. Um, there has been no move towards any significant action. There's been no move towards really even putting them on the official agenda. And at the CMAC meeting at the London Trogon last year, one uh, suggestion that was taken forwards was that it'd be a really good idea to look at examples of where Francophone and Anglophone regions in the Commonwealth had had issues and been brought together and the first place they decided to look was Canada. Um, so, again, we will have another meeting in April. The reality is this isn't going to go forwards. Um, in terms of the Commonwealth making um, position on Cameroon, or most other countries that are in egregious, egregious breach of Commonwealth values short of a military coup, it will have to come from the non-official third branch of the Commonwealth family. Um, that's really an issue of history. You know, the Commonwealth may or may not be 70 this year. It's an interesting but broadly tedious discussion. But in 1949, when um, Salon, India, and Pakistan went to Downing Street for that um, Commonwealth Prime Minister's meeting, they were, they were joining a club. And all of the uh, progression and inventions since then, the Commonwealth hasn't changed from an intergovernmental club. And that's the uh, strength, it can act, it can expel members in a way that other intergovernmental bodies can, can't, but what it can't do really is take very strong action against its members. It, it doesn't do that. Um, consensus is generally required. And that's where organisations such as the Institute of Commonwealth Studies can have such a big impact in um, confidently um, and with robust evidence standing up the Commonwealth values and putting these issues um, on the table. The second point I want to make about the current situation is, whether we like it or not, um, London is still the crucible, whatever word you want to use, about the co of the Commonwealth. Um, two of the three intergovernmental bodies are here. Most of the accredited organisations are either based here or strongly represented here. Most Commonwealth meetings still happen in London. Um, and being cited in London, um, gives the Institute an advantage. It's able to engage with, to promote, um, and have visibility um, within the Commonwealth bubble, if you like. Um, and the, the sort of sub-point of that is, again, whether you like it or not, um, the Srinivasan thesis that the Commonwealth will only work really well if the British are driving it is being tested. You know, the British put a huge effort into the London Chogham. They are... Um, redefining the role of chair and office, the Commonwealth envoy is um, travelling around the Commonwealth, you know, almost like a uh, minor royal, um, you know, giving speeches and um, opening things and, you know, trying to push the sort of global Britain in a, in a Commonwealth context. Um, and so London is hugely important, uh, the Institute's here, that is clearly an advantage. And the third point I'd make, this is more of a domestic UK issue um, is that knowledge of the Commonwealth is woeful, frankly, um, and the Institute of Commonwealth Studies, by putting on events, uh, by engaging in the media, by being sort of a public uh, independent face of the Commonwealth, is clearly doing something to um, address that, and I think, well, for the first time, although there's still no 
um, syllabus that covers the Commonwealth. There is a, a MOOC mm -hmm. or that's called what is it? the Public Commonwealth, the New Commonwealth, the Modern Commonwealth, that anybody can sign up to. Um, and that has to be a positive step. Um, everybody who's interested in signing up for it should speak to Sue, because that's literally the limit of my knowledge on that. I'm not a very good plug, but I'd like to check. <laughs> so, to look at um, the relationship between CHRI and the Institute, which I, I was asked to address, um, CHRI was founded in the late 1980s, uh, really out of the feeling that the Commonwealth wasn't, as it still isn't, really addressing human rights issues. Um, there was a feeling that um, it might spin apart after the large scale boycott of the Edinburgh Games in 1986. Um, and so CHRI was founded initially with the hope of it becoming an intergovernmental initiative, um, not an NGO, but as with so many things, that um, ambition was quashed and the decision was taken to form an NGO, um, the headquarters of which subsequently has moved uh, to New Delhi, but as with many other organ Commonwealth organisations, we retain a strong footprint in London. And in some ways, the Institute was a, a, nat a natural home for an organisation that um, puts its stall on evidence-based advocacy. So strong, independently verified um, evidence, uh, and then engagement rather than confrontation, a very Commonwealth, softly, softly approach, some would say, but um, not afraid to call people out if all else fails. Uh, every two years, we publish a, uh, a well-researched, we hope, um, report that goes to Commonwealth Heads of Government. Um, we've looked at a number of huge issues over the um, R30 years, including the importance of right to information legislation across the Commonwealth, where we've followed up and um, having increasing success. Uh, the last job in London, we looked at um, the issues around contemporary slavery, where the Commonwealth with a um, third of the world's population has 55% of the world's modern slaves, in inverted commas, and that's before you even look at issues of South Asian diasporas living in slave-like conditions in the Middle East. Uh, the next Chogham in Kigali next June will be releasing a report on free trial detention across the Commonwealth, people who are held largely for poverty more than anything, um, and incarcerated, and many of these people serve far longer before they ever get to court than they would have done had they actually been convicted of the crime they were originally arrested for. Um, so for all that, all those reasons, the, the Institute was really a natural home for us, um, and a happy home, and I think, to a large extent, we influenced each other. Uh, Karine mentioned earlier that um, there's quite a large NGO focus on the MA, I think the fact that CHRI was here, it's quite a, it was quite a, a major campaigning NGO, uh, certainly had an impact on that. Um, and for many years, we hosted the uh, Commonwealth Roundtable Studentship Award, you know, that's the right title, um, intern during their year um, in London, and that was always uh, very successful. We got a lot out of it, and I certainly hope that the interns did. And we collaborated again and again on events. Um, I think. Uh, the last big one was on the first day of uh, Patricia Scotland's tenure. We ran a joint event on Secretary General of Human Rights. We commissioned somebody to write a, an overview and we held a panel discussion here. Um, so a lot of collaboration that continues to go in a number of areas. Um, but, although that's all very positive, I think I'd like to point to um, a slightly more modern example of partnership that I think, because it's because it's more focused, and perhaps because it's operating, as I said, in a, a slightly more fertile environment today, um, has the potential to have more impact. And that's the, the media freedom in the Commonwealth Initiative. Um, I think the combination of academic rigour and Commonwealth experience that Dr. Onzo clearly brings, together with providing a base for events and fellows to do research, um, and combine that expertise with civil society activists, really provides an excellent model for how to have impact and get things done. And I think we're already seeing um, the working group um, that produced uh, Commonwealth principles on freedom of expression and the role of the media in good governance. So that's a make sure to get it correct. Um, that is already having impact, I think, with the uh, UK and Canada starting to put money into media. Um, that can only be a positive thing. And there is perhaps small, but still a chance 
that that might well go to Kigali next year and have real impact. Um, and I think that's a real a model because a lot of the too much of the time, um, especially in the UK, we tend to have silos of civil society and academics working in parallel but not together. So bringing those two strands together, uh, obviously everything needs to be funded, that's the depressing fact of life, but bringing those two strands together, I think provides a model that the Institute could use again and again going forwards. And then my third final point, um, and it's slightly a more broader one, is that in an age when experts are definitely not in fashion, and the official Commonwealth has, I think to a large extent, outsourced, am I allowed to say that? <laughs> um, privatised its um, institutional memory um, and you know organisations like the Institute of Commonwealth Studies, the Roundtable are really now the repository of official memory. Um, the Institute is performing a wonderful function in terms of not just putting human rights in the, com the, human rights in the Commonwealth together in the public eye, but hosting fellows um, who have extensive Commonwealth experience, both in the official and non-official Commonwealth, to do high-profile research, um, to publish books, to run events, uh, is an excellent thing. It, if it wasn't doing it, nobody else would be, mm. and so it continues to be incredibly important. Thank you very much, uh, David. I think it's important to have in the the soft power of the Commonwealth that resides in the Commonwealth civil society organizations, and I think your work is an excellent example of that. Uh, and finally, I'd like to invite Dr. Lars Waldorf uh, to present. He ran Human Rights Watch's field office in Rwanda from 2002 to 2004. He's authored numerous publications on transitional justice and peace building, including most recently the book Remaking Rwanda, State Building and Human Rights After Mass Violence. And he's also principal investigator for a funded project on dance and legal empowerment in post-war Sri Lanka, which is very intriguing. But I think he's going to start with something else. So over to you, Lars. Great. Please. Thank you very much. And I was talking to James earlier, and uh, basically um, we have kind of different experiences. I, I fled to Sri Lanka as a researcher after I wasn't able to do research in Rwanda anymore, and he was telling me, well, he can't go back to Sri Lanka, so we have that very, that commonality and difference as well, excluded, but also finding new places to do work. Um, so let me start off by saying I'm really grateful for the opportunity to be here to celebrate the 70th anniversary of the place where I began my academic career. And I think I was a very odd hire for the Institute of Commonwealth Studies in 2006. I mean, obviously, as you can hear, I'm an American, I'm not Canadian, um, and I was working on Rwanda. And at my job interview, I could not have predicted that first, Rwanda would join the Commonwealth, or second, that I would become a British subject. Um, so I need to thank my interview panel, and that was Paul Grady and Richard Cook and Nazila Ghania for being so prescient and actually hiring me. Um, so in my talk today, I really want to do two things. I, I want to discuss a little bit the Institute's contribution to the debate and discussion on human rights in Rwanda, and then make a few observations about Rwanda and the Commonwealth, which really sort of picks up and goes back to the earlier points that were made initially about Cameroon and that have been picked up by other speakers, James and David and others. Um, so let me start off by talking about the Institute in Rwanda. Um, on 10th of February 2009, just about 10 years ago, I was with Alison de Forge, who was an oral historian of colonial Rwanda and also my boss at Human Rights Watch, or my former boss at Human Rights Watch. And she was speaking at Chatham House about Rwanda's bid to join the Commonwealth. And Allison was ever an optimist, and she suggested that admission to the Commonwealth might lead to some improvement in Rwanda's human rights record. Um, two days later, I was in my office at 28, uh, Russell, you know, just down the road, and I got the news that uh, Allison had been killed in a plane crash on her way home to Buffalo. Uh, just over a month later, we managed to organize here at the Institute a conference on reconstructing Rwanda in Allison's memory. It featured 18 speakers. It ran a record from, I think, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. at night. Um, and afterwards, I was told off by the health and safety folks 
um, that the number of people at the event had threatened to maybe bring down the first floor. So that, that's always a sign of success, right? When the health and safety people get on your case. The conference became the basis for the book, Remaking Rwanda, that Corinne mentioned earlier. And it was edited by myself and Scott Strauss from University of Wisconsin-Madison. Almost half those chapters in that book were written by conference speakers, including three of us from the Institute, Paul Grady, myself, and a then PhD student now teaching um, over at the uh, UCL, Curly Pals. And that book was really meant to further Allison's legacy of human rights scholarship, but also to function as a one-stop shop for anyone interested in Rwanda's post-genocide trajectory. And given that this year marks the 10th anniversary of Allison's death, if, if you'll indulge me, I just want to say a few words from the book's preface. Allison was the most vocal and knowledgeable champion for human rights in Rwanda, um, and her untimely death had been a tremendous loss. She arguably did more than anyone to prevent, publicize, and document the 1994 genocide, one of the worst human rights crimes of the 20th century, and to ensure justice in its aftermath. Yet she was also able to see past the genocide thanks to her early career as a historian of colonial Rwanda and her late career as a human rights advocate in post-genocide Rwanda. Her historical scholarship, genocide documentation, and human rights reporting were all infused with an intellectual rigor, nuanced understanding, and a generous attention to those who were sidelined by history, historiography, and politics. And so again, I think given the tradition of people like Shula Marx here, it was wonderful to be able to celebrate um, the life and legacy of another historian, um, somebody who was really my, very much my hero. Um, as soon as the book was published, the Rwandan government went into its usual attack mode. Uh, even the homepage of the Rwandan embassy in Washington, D.C., linked to a blog that made ad hominem attacks on several of the contributors. And a few years later, uh, the Rwandan government put me and my co-editor on a list of uh, people who deny the genocide. A, gross, a grotesque allegation, but one that effectively prevents us from going back. Um, and also sends a really powerful signal to other scholars inside, but also, of course, outside Rwanda, not to be too critical of the regime. Um, and as painful as that has been, we are in good company. Allison herself, um, who testified for the prosecution at the in International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda in many, many cases, was herself accused of promoting genocide ideology and prevented from visiting Rwanda in the last year of her life. And Karina Tertsakian, who spoke at the conference here at ICS and wrote a chapter in that book, was later expelled from Rwanda. And of course, Rwanda has banned the BBC's Kenya Rwanda service on spurious grounds of genocide denial for upwards of five years now. So let me say a little about the Commonwealth in Rwanda. Um, Allison was usually right about everything. It was one of her most annoying characteristics. But she was uncharacteristically wrong when she told the Chatham House audience that, hey, Commonwealth membership might sort of nudge Rwanda in a positive direction, both in terms of domestic human rights, but also in terms of its behavior in Congo. But she wasn't alone in that kind of optimism. Um, Alex Vines, who's head of the Africa program at Chatham House, he also thought Commonwealth membership would mean, and he put it very nicely, uh, Rwanda will be held to account partly because the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative will visit Rwanda more regularly now. <laughs> okay. um, it won't come as a surprise to many of you, but uh, since admission to the Commonwealth, Rwanda's human rights record has hardly improved. And I'll just mention a few things very quickly. Uh, the Constitution's term limits were amended, so President Kagame can conceivably stay in office until 2034. That would be 40 years after he first took power. I forget what Paul Bia is on now. 36. Okay, so he's going for the record, okay? Um, Kagame also won in the last presidential election in 2017. He won 98.63, I love that, 0.63% of the vote. Um, and this was a vote where Commonwealth observers were conspicuous by their absence because they had not been invited. Um, there's also very strong evidence that Rwanda sent hit squads to two of its fellow Commonwealth countries, South Africa and the UK. 
and it did so to eliminate the president's most vocal critics. Um, you can think of it as um, Salisbury avant Salisbury. Um, I've mentioned the BBC Kenya Rwanda service, and of course the UK High Court blocked the extradition of five genocide suspects in 2017, suspects who actually have a fair amount of evidence against them, but the, the extradition was blocked because the judges in the High Court didn't think they could be assured a fair trial in Rwanda. And of course Rwanda has supported uh, vicious rebel groups in Congo. So if we go back to the, before Rwanda became a member of the Commonwealth, you had the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative in a very hard-hitting report by Professor Yash Gai, who opposed Rwanda's membership. And he said, he wrote, it does not make sense to admit a state that already does not satisfy Commonwealth standards. This would tarnish the reputation of the Commonwealth and confirm the opinion of many that the leaders of its governments do not really care for democracy and human rights and that its periodic solemn declarations are merely hot air. Now the fact that Rwanda is now hosting Chogun 2020 only makes clearer that human rights has become just another of what Professor Philip Murphy calls, quote, the Commonwealth's empty pronouncements. And Philip has also written that the take home lesson from the Sri Lanka Chogun was that, quote, a stagnant organization with a weak leadership and an equally weak sense of ownership among its members is vulnerable to capture by anyone willing to devote the necessary time and energy. Well, Rwanda clearly learned that lesson well. Uh, Richard Byrne uh, recently wrote in a, in a piece that the Rwanda Chogum does raise very profoundly the question of whether it is too late to rescue the Commonwealth Charter from the waste paper basket. Now, happily, the Institute has not followed the Commonwealth's lead on human rights. Rather, it's become, as you've heard, a very active hub for teaching, research, and knowledge exchange about human rights. And more specifically, under uh, the, the current sort of leadership, indigenous and minority rights, LGBTQI rights, and refugee rights. Um, and ICS has also trained over these many years it's trained a new generation of human rights advocates and scholars. I'm often always surprised to stumble over uh, graduates of the MA program who are working in human rights now, and some of them are doing very, very impressive work. So again, to go back and, and, and borrow a few phrases from, from, from Philip's recent book on the Commonwealth, I would say that the Commonwealth, now having been commandeered by outright villains, such as Kagami and Rajapaksa, it might finally be time for the Institute to rebrand itself as something maybe a little more human rights friendly. Perhaps the Institute of Commonweal and Human Rights Studies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lars, for that, that uh, presentation of the case study of Rwanda. And I think it's an important Rwanda reminder that the freedom to do research on human rights across Commonwealth countries is not assured, it's not a right that's protected everywhere, which makes it all the more important that we highlight today this, this freedom and space that we have to do that in London. Uh, interestingly, on your last point, we did have a discussion prompted by Philip, should we change the title <laughs> of the Institute? Institute of Critical Commonwealth Studies. Right. Yeah, there's one possibility, but uh, maybe there's some other ideas for it. So we have time for some discussion and uh, questions for our panelists or other reflections. Please, Richard. Um, well, thank you very much to all of the panelists. Um, and I wanted just to say I was the first director of the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative, as you heard, an activist and campaigning organization, uh, which was in our neighboring building around the corner in Russell Square. And I wanted to start by saying a very big thank you to Shula Marx, because she was the director here who allowed us to come in as a tenant in 1990 and really do the work uh, that we did, setting up this organization, publishing a manifesto called Put Our World to Rights, uh, for, and which in the run up to the Harare summit in 1991, we believe was quite influential. And uh, I was then able, with the collaboration of the five founder organizations, to move the main office to New Delhi, where it has flourished. There are now about 50 people there. Uh, there are now a significant number of people working in Accra. And as you have heard from David White, he's running an operation here in London. 
But I would also like to thank um, Shula's successor, uh, Professor James Mainland, who um, was a passionate enthusiast for human rights, as you know. It was he who set up the human rights course here. Uh, I've sometimes disagreed with him because I didn't feel he had a significant enough uh, Commonwealth quotient in, in that course. It was very much international lawyers, amnesty, etc. And actually, there is, for better or worse, a considerable amount of Commonwealth jurisprudence, etc., etc., related to human rights. But I didn't want to talk about the past. I, I'm very uh, concerned about the present and the future. And I hope that the CHI will continue to work closely with the Institute on events, but also maybe more substantial things. Uh, David has referred to the media work, which is important. I'm a former journalist myself. So I think uh, anything in that field is, is tough in the Commonwealth. Uh, Commonwealth governments, on the whole, don't like media. Uh, and also, media is changing. Uh, and the uh, commercial basis of the traditional print media is collapsing all over the place, mm -hmm. notably in Canada, actually, in your own country, uh, Corinne. Um, so I think there is some very serious work there where the two um, bodies can collaborate. But one area I wanted to um, highlight where the CHRI has been doing very important work is in the Human Rights Council in Geneva. Mm -hmm. where I know students here annually go on a visit and it's one of the highlights for the MA students that they go to Geneva. Now, what the CHRI has been doing is elaborate uh, coverage of the performance of the Commonwealth governments in the Human Rights Council in Geneva. And this is actually quite illuminating. To go back to Rwanda, obviously I, I think that Rwanda should never have joined the Commonwealth and that the Commonwealth should never have chosen Kigali as its next venue. But, very interestingly, before being elected as a member of the Human Rights Council, all countries, including Commonwealth governments, have to state what their human rights objectives are and what they would like to see and what they would like to do through the Council. And I'm pleased to say that all the Commonwealth countries have done so, with the exception of Rwanda, which didn't say anything at all. Um, this is just a little thing to pull out, but why I believe that sort of some research uh, based at the Institute and with the knowledge and enthusiasm of some of the young students who are going there every year, and this ongoing commitment by the CHRI as a, an activist campaigning uh, organisation could be <coughs> fruitful in the future. So I just wanted to put that on the table as a suggestion. But in the meantime, a very big thank you to the Institute, which has been a host, it's still a registered uh, office for the, um, the Senate House, is still a registered office for the uh, Common Human Rights Initiative in London. A big thank you to uh, Professor Shula Marx and to Professor James May. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I wonder if uh, when the CHRI or when the Institute of Commonwealth Studies or anybody else adopts uh, critical analyses of Cameroon, Rwanda, Sri Lanka, or the appalling abuses taking, have been taking place under the Modi government yeah. in India, whether the credibility of these uh, critical analyses might uh, be enhanced if uh, the CHRI and the Institute and others also paid attention to common, uh, human rights abuses in the industrialized nations of the Commonwealth, I think of the uh, uh, extreme <coughs> policies of the Abbott government in Australia, and uh, you think of Tony Blair's government, he managed to, the, the list of, of rights which he did not abuse any wrote. Is, is shorter than the list which he did abuse, and he wrote the uh, habeas corpus, freedom of expression, freedom of uh, assembly, the right to a jury trial, the right to remain silent, which is a, which is a, implies a rejection of the presumption of innocence, etc. I, I think uh, there might be greater credibility in, in dealing with the uh, less developed sections of the Commonwealth if one also had this kind. And I know I, I, I raised this with CHRI people in New Delhi, and, and they were rather keen. So I think uh, it, it's, it's an idea worth considering. Thank you. Other comments or questions from the floor?
Um, I'd like to, um, I, I really appreciated the, uh, the contributions. And for me, there is a, a, a very obvious contradiction here between um, what is clearly the intention of, of the panel and perhaps most people in this room to try to get the Commonwealth taking human rights more seriously and more actively. In fact, for me, it's, it's, it ought to be the, uh, the kind of additional value purpose of the institution. And yet, David White in his presentation very skillfully um, explained why that's not going to happen, and indeed why it is systemically, structurally, historically, and practically impossible. So what we have is, is a, a singular contradiction here for us. Now, we can try to repair and travel a little bit over that gulf through the obviously excellent work of the Institute uh, and the, um, the initiative and, and individuals and other bodies, but the gulf kind of remains. And um, when Philip analyzes it and describes it in, in you know, strong, literary language. That merely illustrates the problem, but it doesn't help us in our journey. So um, I'm not saying anything radical or new here, but I just want to put this firmly on the table because it seems to me that that is our great problem. And um, you know, one could hope for some kind of spectacular moment when we expel another country because that will bring focus and attention to it. But, but we're moving in the opposite direction. Viz having the next um, mm -hmm. summit in in, um, in Rwanda. So the question that I want to hear thoughts about is is how how I mean do we do we simply we, we recognise this issue and do we simply then redouble our efforts in other areas? Because obviously there are there are many organisations and um, um, other bodies that could take this forward, though they have relatively I mean, in, in some ways, they, they lack power. Um, so you have to use the media, you have to use individual case studies, you have to use stories, you have to use the law, and so on. But is there a more general, I mean, is, is, does anyone have any thoughts about um, Richard and Okay, I think we'll come back to the, the panel. That was kind of a collection of thoughts from the four, including a uh, final question about sort of bridging this gap between the commitments and compliance of the Commonwealth, and also the critical role that research can play in both the global north and south in uh, securing human rights in Commonwealth states. So uh, perhaps I'll ask uh, David to begin, please. Um, so it's tempting, isn't it, sort of sat within a very small Commonwealth bubble in London, um, to only ever focus on the Commonwealth. But Richard mentioned uh, the Human Rights Council. Rwanda didn't make any pledges um, of the other pledges by Commonwealth countries, a large number of them were never met. And of course, Saudi Arabia has been on the Human Rights Council. So the Commonwealth is clearly not very good at this, but it's important to remember that there are other intergovernmental bodies that are also not very good at it. It is an inherent problem with intergovernmental structures. Um, and there is a female, I think American academic, who wrote a paper whose name alludes me embarrassingly, who basically asserted that intergovernmental bodies never die. Mm. Um, and so, following that through, the Commonwealth exists and it's going to continue to exist um, and depending on the quality of its leadership, uh, will be better or worse funded, um, but it's going to continue, it's, it's a game and it's in town and we are all attached to it. Um, I think one of the problems with the Commonwealth is we have this, okay, so, you know, the running joke was that the UN canteen in New York had a higher budget than the Commonwealth Secretariat, and that was before the cuts. But still, if you look at the three branches of the Commonwealth, and governments aren't really going to take this on in a Commonwealth context, that leaves the intergovernmentals and us as the Commonwealth family. The Commonwealth family is frankly underperforming. We are all underfunded, under-resourced, um, and frankly not doing enough to rebalance the democracy versus development debate that always seems to come down on the side of development. Uh, I mean, CHRI has been weak on, uh, at, you know, in more industrialised countries. We've spoken about Australia um, and the situation with refugees in statements 
We made a statement the other week uh, about the Begum case in the UK. But yes, there, there's clearly so much more that we could and should be doing. Um, but at the end of the day, you, you need to prioritise with what are limited resources. Okay, I mean, I, I think a couple of things just to say, which is, I guess why I feel sort of a bit hopeless about the Commonwealth, I suppose, is that it's, you know, it's, of course it's hard to criticize an existing member, very hard to, to think about expelling them. So, in a sense, there was an opportunity for the Commonwealth not to expand the family by taking in a new dictatorship, and certainly not to have the Chogun in Kigali. I don't think those were that difficult of choices for it to make, and that it made such the wrong choices, I think, is very worrying, is very worrying. and again, it, it sends a broader message about the legitimation of these kind of regimes to other uh, regional and global bodies. So that's one thing I would say. Second thing I would say is that there is really interesting, as Corinne will know, there's really interesting work that's been done um, mostly by um, international relations scholars about kind of commitment and compliance and how regional groupings can kind of move states to kind of, they call it the contagion effect, but you hope it's the human rights contagion effect. And again, it would be interesting to maybe do something comparative along that line with the Commonwealth and to think, why is the contagion effect going in the, or seeming to go in the opposite direction? So that might be something to, to, to think about in terms of scholarship. Um, I guess the final question I had, and it was really kind of raised by, by both David and James, is about where, how CHRI did something remarkable way long before Amnesty or Human Rights Watch did, which is that they moved their headquarters to the Global South, and that was really impressive. Um, but the danger of that is, is obviously a Modi-type government comes in. And so I guess I'm, I'm also interested, if we have time, for you guys to maybe tell us how CHRI <coughs> is coping in what is now a very repressive environment. Yeah, I think I'm out of sync with a lot of what's been saying because I actually see the Commonwealth as a people more than an institution. And I think that's come across maybe in my research as well, that a lot of the times the people have experienced the institutions and not been included in the institutions anyway, so we just get on with it. Um, so I, I find it a bit, I think the Commonwealth is relevant because if I look at my existence or existence of many populations, my existence is kind of because of the Commonwealth. That's why I'm kind of here. So when you say the Commonwealth's not relevant, I'm kind of, it doesn't make sense to me that the Commonwealth isn't relevant because I'm seeing it as, as a people and an experience um, ongoing. And you've got the Queen in the Caribbean at the moment. Is it the Queen? No, it's not. It's Camilla, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> not yet. But um, yeah, in the Caribbean at the moment, it's still kind of, even if it's just symbolic there's I mean she, they're there and they're out with their flags and their national colors and so forth so I think it's not just about institution I completely understand the institutional role but having come from a kind of heritage I suppose where institution hasn't really been on my side in a way I see it more as a people anyway um, so and in terms of research I think retrospectively that um, Commonwealth can be very important. There's a whole decolonisation movement going on. Um, I suppose that's more looking backward, but some people um, would argue that, well, that hasn't been dealt with yet, so maybe that is part of going forward, that you sort out the sort of uh, attitude, not attitude, but the kind of what, what misdemeanors maybe that took place previously. And I think there is a whole new agenda going forward that is relevant to the Commonwealth and decolonisation. I think a lot of things that took place, um, I mean, it's probably more empire and, and um, rather than Commonwealth, but the two are, are linked, um, that there's still a lot that needs to be looked at going forward. Um, so that's, um, that's my point of view. Um, I'll just add briefly as a privilege of chair in terms of LGBT rights, what we see in the, the Commonwealth is um, certainly civil society coming together to try and see how this space could be useful because of the legacy of the sodomy laws across the Commonwealth, which is quite a distinct feature of the colonial legacy. 
and something called the Commonwealth Equality Network. This is a, a global network of LGBT rights NGOs has emerged. There's about more than 40 members now. And they met recently to discuss how we use the Kigali Chogun to advance the agenda. And they're very savvy about how they will do that. They focus especially on the people's forms, the sort of parallel forms, for a process of socialization to new norms, rather than necessarily the high level political discussion where they, they don't necessarily see open doors or possibilities. So that's an example of stepping outside of the, the formal intergovernmental, uh, as, as they would say, which won't die, but perhaps won't evolve by it, um, to, to use the Commonwealth in a different way, in a way that they are seeing some small uh, successes over the years, including with the last term in the UK and the apology of Theresa May. Uh, right. <laughs> which was to the civil society, no, actually, not to yes. the intergovernmental. Uh, right, so there's, I saw some hands, so uh, uh, please, uh, yes. I've got a bad throat, so if you can't hear me, tell me. Um, I, I um, worked with the Colonial Secretariat um, when it became the campaigning organization in the 60s, 70s, 80s, to the early 90s. So I've seen it grow, and I've seen how it operates. And I think people do not realize that governments still have the right to make certain decisions. And I'll give you two, 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 two things. One of the first persons or group that turned up in the early 60s to ask if the Commonwealth could do something about them were the Canadian Indians. I don't know, first Canadians, I think. Chief Many Fingers um, from the prairies. Why is it you're looking after the black people in South Africa? We went to Australia in 1985. We were welcomed as Coons Holiday on Government Money. Um, the first Australians, they may be second, but the original Australians came to Melbourne. The vitriol that was poured on them, they also came to beg Sonny Ramphal. How is it you're only worried about South Africa? We have had, what, 300 years? And even today now, people are beginning to talk about the situation. One of Australia's, there were letters in the Melbourne Herald, one of the most prominent Australians wrote, we should do what we did with them in the old days, poison their water holes. We could that. We were sort of apologize to both of them. We had taken on South Africa. We had got consensus, but there's no way uh, there was a feeling that you give leverage to the old colonies. They will solve their problems. But even today, I've stopped going to the US. The, the Canadian Indians are still there, indigenous, and they are, now they've got a voice and they're very busy. So, you know, it's, governments are, have a right to do what they want to do to a certain extent. That's the first thing I want to say. So don't just blame governments. Um, you know, they know their people better than you do. And this is what I want to ask because I've never found out. Rwanda went through this, this hor horrific genocide. You and did nothing. There were what, French troops in Rwanda. Nobody told them to protect those people. Now today, you know, we're all concerned about what is happening in Rwanda. But nobody has told me, is the opposition to Kagame Hutu or is it Tutsi? Nobody mentioned. Is it, is it, did he ask, um, if, if Kagame is fully supported by the British government, don't blame the Commonwealth for going. Britain now is, um, and they want to go. A cynic told me, Rwanda holds the key to the east of Congo, and everybody wants to be there. Australia has mining companies, Britain has mining companies, America has mining companies, in the most horrific parts of the Congo. So, you know, to expect the Commonwealth to be this all powerful organization, which should either expel and nobody else is doing. The UN, um, the apartheid came in in the 40s, late 40s, and it wasn't until 1970 something, 1980 something, when the Commonwealth sent the group to Australia that Canada. Of Canada, of um, America, to say they would support Africa. So you know, give the Commonwealth a break. But can you answer? Because you know Rwanda, 
And the Commonwealth would not have gone to uh, Rwanda if the British government. And the, Rwanda is supported by the United States and Britain. So, you know, we're, the, the powerful countries in the world are bigger than the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. And the Commonwealth is not about to tell them we are not going to, mm -hmm. to Rwanda. All right, so can you answer me? I, this is really just seeking information because I've never figured out whether this is a bit of a payback time in your in, in Rwanda. Can you help me there, please? Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll, we'll get your answer to your question in just a moment. We'll take a couple of other. Do you have a question? Yeah. Well, it was, I was just going to say that um, having listened to the panelists, which I feel, which I believe were really, really eloquent on, I did get a different perspective from your talks. Um, the question I want to, the question or the, the you know, information I want to pass is, Research is very relevant at the moment, and your suggestion, Dr. White, in marrying research with um, the media is a very brilliant suggestion. However, with do it, dealing with research on certain human rights issues, um, is it possible? Because you, I feel that everything is interconnected. You know, the Commonwealth may stand for economic and um, socio-cultural growth, but that would not happen if the people are already repressed using human rights abuse. Because again, bringing in the mental health issue into it, if people are suffering abuse and human rights violation, there's no way they are mentally capable to be productive economically and even develop their societies. So it's all interrelated. and. If the Commonwealth stands for some sort of progress, then it, they cannot completely, you know, ignore the human rights aspect and impact it has. It has on progress and, you know, economic growth. So how can research sort of bring in these interconnections and make the voice make their voices louder that these things all affect each other? Thank you very much for the question. Yeah, just a just kind of footnote on relocating the headquarters of the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative in the Global South in New Delhi. Um, the uh, CHRI works under very tricky circumstances in India. Uh, Amnesty International, uh, Nobel Prize winner, uh, has been charged with sedition and its accounts have been frozen by the Modi government. Uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, Nobel Prize winner, has also been charged with sedition. Now, the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative operates in this climate. It, does, it has not been charged with any ser serious crime yet, uh, but um, it is clearly, a, it, it and, and lots of other humane civil society organizations in, in India are operating in a very tricky situation. But if you look at the periodic, frequent reports that emerge in uh, your own mailing list, from the CHRI every what, week or two, mm -hmm. uh, the output uh, of uh, solid reporting on all manner of Commonwealth countries and, and all manner of human rights issues, the output is very impressive. And it's, it's very voluminous, and in that voluminous output there are quite telling uh, re revelations about what's happening in India. So it's a very tricky business, but it's so far, moving to New Delhi has not been fatal. Mm. 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 <laughs> okay, thank you. So I think we will ask Lars to begin. So yeah, yeah, so I mean, you, you had a number of, of, of points. I'll just address the, the, the main one. There's no question that part of the reason Rwanda becomes part of the Commonwealth is because you have a lot of advocacy for that from the UK and from Uganda. Right, so that that's partly why that happens, um, and you know, and again, it goes back to the point that David raised earlier, which is that the for for the UK, you know, you Rwanda has become their donor darling. You know, it was and and they've kind of taken it from the Francophonie and brought it into the Anglophonie, right? And so there are these kind of aspects to that, but it goes back to the point that. Again, the Commonwealth is privileging developmentalism and dictatorial developmentalism over anything approaching human rights. 
Thank you. And uh, Karen, did you want to address the question that you had about what role can research play in, in amplifying voices of people in terms of human rights violations? Um, I think, I sometimes think research is the only way you could amplify voices, actually. Um, when media may not be interested, other institutions may not be interested, especially if it's political or unpopular. Um, and I think that's been the case with like LGBT communities, um, hidden histories. I think research, and I, said, I think my research, I would say that would be, but I, I do think that some, I don't think anyone would have explored my research, I, I, well it hadn't been, unless a researcher had noticed that and said, right, I'm going to do it. And that's not just about me, that's about all researchers, and you, you know, you reckon everything's amongst yourselves. Um, I do think research is very powerful, it, um, and you do get access to things if you, you know, I mean, the journalists are meant to get access to things, but I think next in line probably is researchers will get access to documents by being an ac academic or someone that's meant to be impartial. I still think that researchers, academics are respected more. Um, I, I mean, I'm happy for someone to disagree with that, but I do think academics tend not to be, well, in some countries, uh, um, obviously some, some countries with human rights violations don't, but I do think that academics probably have access to, oh, in a position to advocate more than journalists, other people that may have a political agenda. So I think research is very important. I think that it's normally born out of curiosity rather than political, um, not always, but I think often with younger people it's maybe curiosity more than political agendas. So I think research can be very powerful coming from a student. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so the Commonwealth Equality Network was mentioned a couple of times, and interestingly, I think that in some ways pulls together the three uh, themes within the question. Um, they are uh, phenomenal, they've been very successful. One of the reasons they've been very successful is that all of their work is based on very strong uh, research, and of course when politicians, when policymakers uh, are being advocated that they like to see often quite short notes but with robust um, stats in it. Um, the second point is that let's not kid ourselves, they're doing fantastic work, but their agenda aligns with the soft power ambition of um, specifically Canada but also Australia, the United Kingdom, and Malta. Um, and Corinne mentioned they've just had a, a global forum uh, in Mauritius, I think, um, and one of the the notable absentees there was that there were no there was no representative from India, um, where clearly there is a uh, despite the domestic LGBT agenda moving forwards in a very positive way, there is clearly a very restricted civil society space, and domestic NGOs are reluctant uh, to engage internationally. Okay. Other questions or comments from the floor? Um, I thank all the panelists. David, you made a particular reference to um, the work that a, a group of colleagues and I are doing on media freedom. Do you see another key aspect that we could use that model and then develop that rather than a scattergun, or scattergun approach? Is there one particular issue that you think, yes, this is higher up the hierarchy of issues that need to be addressed and this is where you should focus your energies? Um, can I just give you, let's see if there's anything else from the floor, I'll give David a moment to think about that challenging question. Any other questions or comments? No? Okay, you're on the spot. Oh, right. oh, 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 wow. yes, yes, the death penalty, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's absurd that we haven't put that to rest in the Commonwealth, so that might be an issue. I'm just hoping David. Right. <laughs> Thank you. I think mean, it's actually a priority issue for the UK and EU as well. So, uh, so there is actually a Commonwealth project focusing on uh, the death penalty in the Commonwealth Caribbean, uh, which is being run out of uh, Dowdy Street Chambers uh, and their death penalty project, I believe. Uh, so I haven't got an answer. Um, but I promise to come back to you with one. <laughs> right. Well, I think if there's no further questions from the floor, then I just, sorry, she's looking at me. <laughs> Did you want to make a comment, Sue? 
I do, but only when you close the panel. Okay. okay. Uh, so thank you very much to all of our panelists for your excellent contributions and reflections. I think you've given some ideas, actually concrete ideas, that the Institute can take forward. So we will take those to our colleagues. And please join me in thanking our panelists for their time. Um, ladies and gentlemen, panelists, I'm going to allow you to continue sitting comfortably while I draw uh, the day's discussion or the afternoon's discussion to a conclusion. I want to thank you, our speakers from the first panel, and also our speakers from the second panel, and you, the audience, for your questions that you've put to us. Um, as has been noted, the Institute of Commonwealth Studies is indeed 70 this year, even though there's quite a debate about whether the Commonwealth itself is with the convenient myth of, the, of course, the Declaration of London of 1949. Um, I think that uh, what has come through here is the wealth of knowledge, the value of the Institute in creating the necessary safe space, in bringing necessary academic rigour, in focusing upon key contemporary issues of international diplomacy and also the ongoing pressing issues which need to be addressed. So uh, we recognize that we are a small institute, but we have a wide network of intellectual fellowship, it has to be said, um, and we will continue our work. And the most important work, of course, is to reach out in terms of public engagement and to the future, to the student body. Um, and I think Karen particularly, thank you very much indeed for representing a young academic with moves to the future, which I think is superb. Um, I'd like to give my particular thanks, uh, starting off, to Professor Shula Marx, who highlighted the <coughs> importance of uh, the study of history and in its complexity during her stewardship of the Institute of Commonwealth Studies. What Shula didn't underline is the wealth of all those papers are available now. It is an extraordinary collection of extended papers which were rigorously tested um, in an academic forum and which are available to researchers. And you look through it and it is an extraordinary library of knowledge just at a time when history of Southern Africa, particularly South Africa, was not being studied in the country itself. And so the study of history was a political act. It was part of the struggle. And Shula was extraordinary in bringing that to wider attention and acclaim. And I really would like to, to thank you for that. Um, as she said, ideas there were tested, they may be jettisoned, but they were interrogated. And um, our particular thanks, of course, to Judge Albie Sachs for making the journey up from South Africa, for underlining the place that the Institute offered him at a critical point of his intellectual thinking um, and his, I think, his intellectual recovery from um, the, of course, the assassination attempt in Mozambique. He set it very firmly in context. And that's what I think we need to understand here, is saying the Institute is part of that wider context, those intellectual ideas. He too underlined the importance of academic rigour in pub public debate and in research. Um, I'd also like to thank Elizabeth for bringing us very firmly up to date with her incisive presentation in saying that we need to look at excluded communities and the importance of inclusion to address issues around alienation and the cross-fertilization that can be enormously valuable in addressing continued social ills which are so important that we need to do that as we look to the future. Uh, my thanks to Corinne for um, chairing this particular panel. Um, I was fascinated. I, I read, I have to say, Karen's upgrade, so I know very well <laughs> the socialization of the Caribbean community. It was a really, it's going to be a really, really fascinating thesis um, when it is indeed published, and I'm looking forward to that. We finally completed it, got through your Bible, I'm very confident about that, and then you're moving to publication. My thanks to David, um, with whom I have to say I organised an event on the re-inclusion or the reapplication of Gambia and Zimbabwe to the Commonwealth, which we organised at the time of the Commonwealth Summit um, last year, um, which I think offered some very useful similarities, but the critical differences that operate in the historic, the social, economic and political climates in each country and the possibilities of engagement and also the challenges that continue to confront these countries and the Commonwealth as it seeks to, uh, to respond to that approach for re-engagement. 
Thanks to Lars, of course, for highlighting the very problematic aspects of holding the next Commonwealth Summit in Kigali. I want to thank Philip also, and also Stuart Mull, um, for the work that you did and the platform that we used here at the Institute in the discussions around whether the uh, 2013 summit in, uh, in Colombo was the appropriate venue for a values-based association. And I think these issues are very relevant um, and should be debated. The Institute should highlight this um, in the next year as we go forward. Um, I want to know from um, David where else we should collaborate in trying to reach out in public engagement. I'm uh, privileged to be involved with colleagues on the Commonwealth principles around uh, the role of media and freedom of expression. Um, and I'm delighted that we've been able to make excellent contacts with the Foreign Office, with the Secretariat and with the broader um, academic community. Uh, my thanks to the Round Table also because we were able to publish a special issue coming out of an inaugural conference uh, that we held here at the Institute on the Commonwealth and challenges to media freedom. So we continue our work to highlight the challenges to media, freedom of expression as a critical underpinning of good governance and democracy. Um, another plug, um, we are holding an event on South Africa and the media and the forthcoming elections on uh, 3rd of April um, this year, which follows hard on the heels of one that we've just done on India and uh, the media and freedom of expression and challenges going forward to the media, uh, the Indian elections. But most of all, as I say, I'd like to thank all of you for here. My thanks to Philip for that inspiring uh, <laughs> and the future of the Institute and its intellectual importance and also its importance as a community of scholars to the wider community. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you.